Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome to the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. I'm Ian Shapiro, the, the current director, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity today to be the host and int introduce John J. Mearsheimer, who's this year's Henry L. Stimson lecturer. Uh, he's the Wendell Harrison Distinguished Service Pro Professor of Political Science and co-director of the Program on International Security at the University of Chicago. Professor Mearsheimer has written extensively about security issues and international politics more generally. He's published uh, five major books, including perhaps the one he's best known for, uh, The Tragedy of, the Great, of Great Power Politics, which came out in 2001, and a, a second edition in 2014 which won the Joseph Lepgold Book Prize and has been translated into eight languages. And then with Steve Walt in 2007, The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy, which became a New York Times bestseller and has been translated into 24 languages. He's also written many articles in academic journals such as International Security and in more popular um, outlets such as uh, Foreign Affairs and the London Review of Books. He's won an, a number of teaching awards and became a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2003. He's here today to give uh, three lectures from, from his forthcoming book of Stimson Lectures that will be published next year by Yale University Press uh, under the general heading Liberal Ideals and International Realities. Today is the first of the three. Its title is The Roots of Liberal Hegemony. His next lecture, which will be on Wednesday, will be entitled The False Promise of Liberal Hegemony. And Thursday's lecture will be called The Case for Restraint. I hope you'll be able to join us for the whole series of these lectures. Uh, the funding for this lecture series comes from an anonymous donor in honor of Henry L. Stimson, Yale College class of 1889, an attorney and statesman whose government service culminated in his ten tenure as Secretary of War during the Second World War. Since 1998, the Macmillan Center and Yale University Press have collaborated to bring distinguished diplomats and foreign policy experts to the center to lecture on their books that are published in this series by Yale University Press. Some of the previous Stimson lectures have included Samuel Huntington's Political Order in Changing Societies, Schelling's, uh, political, uh, Schelling's Arms and Influence, uh, The Arab Center, The Promise of Moderation by Marwan Muwasha, What Happened to National Liberation by Michael Walzer, and David Mayhew's Imprint of Congress. I'm very pleased today to be able to introduce Professor John Mearsheimer. Welcome. Thank you very much, Ian. Can everybody in the rear hear me? Okay, I am wired up. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, of course, I know who Henry Stimson was, what student of international security does it. And I've also long known about the Stimson lectures because two of my uh, favorite books, both of which Ian mentioned, Sam Huntington's book, Political Order and Changing Societies, and Thomas Schelling's very famous book, Arms and Influence, uh, were originally Stimson lectures. Uh, so it's a great honor to be following in their footsteps. Uh, and before I start, I'd like to thank Ian very much uh, for inviting me to be here today uh, to give this lecture, and then of course to give the lectures on Wednesday and on Thursday. Uh, let me just give you a brief uh, overview of what I want to try and do. I, I want to start off with some preliminary remarks, just tell you some stories about the book, uh, its genesis, and so forth and so on. Uh, then I want to talk about the roots of liberal hegemony. Uh, and as will become clear as we go along here, this is really not much of an international relations talk. The international relations comes in the Wednesday lecture and in the Thursday lecture. Uh, what I'm going to try and do tonight is provide background uh, for those subsequent lectures. and That'll become clear as I go along. So as Ian said, I'll be talking about the false promise of liberal hegemony Wednesday night and then 
Thursday make the case for a more restrained foreign policy. Uh, talk a little bit about the genesis of the book. Uh, first of all, when I started this thing about 10 years ago, what I really wanted to do is write a big theory book on the relationship between liberalism, nationalism, uh, and realism. I had written the book on realism, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, so I knew a lot about realism, but I didn't say much about liberalism in that book. And liberalism and realism are the two great isms in the IR world. Social constructivism, critical theory, Marxism, all these other isms are mildly interesting. When you strip away all the layers of the onion, it boils down to realism versus liberalism. I've spent half my life battling with liberals, right, as a good realist. So I knew a lot about that, but I hadn't thought much about liberalism in any detail. And then there's nationalism. I'm a big believer that nationalism is the most powerful political ideology on the planet. That'll become clear as we go along here and in the subsequent lectures. I also believe that nationalism and realism are very closely related. Uh, almost all realists believe in the power of nationalism, but hardly any realists have written about nationalism, and nationalism is not incorporated into their theories, right? So I started thinking about the relationship between realism and nationalism, and of course nationalism and liberalism. And what I wanted to do was figure out, in a theoretical way, just sort of how all of these isms fit together. The problem I ran into is I couldn't do it. I, I spent two years trying to write a book on it, and I couldn't do it. And I couldn't figure out how to organize it. it there was just no organizing principle uh, to make the book work. Then the second thing is, I could never figure out what liberalism really is, because the literature is just very hard to discern. And the truth be told, it took me two to three years just to figure out what I'm going to tell you here today. It may all seem patently obvious, and maybe it is to some of you. I only wish you had told me before I spent two to three years trying to figure it out for myself. So I had a lot of trouble figuring out exactly what liberalism is, and then I couldn't write a book that did what I wanted to do. Now, there was another big issue I cared about, and that was liberal hegemony. Uh, liberal hegemony is basically the foreign policy that the United States has pursued uh, since the Cold War ended. Almost everybody I know agrees on this. Uh, some people use a different label for it, but I think liberal hegemony is a fair label, and it's one that many people use. Very important to understand that the foreign policy establishment, or with Ben Rhodes, you remember Ben Rhodes, he worked for Barack Obama, he called the foreign policy establishment the blob. The blob loves liberal hegemony, right? It's, it's, it's the approved solution for how to conduct American foreign policy. But at the same time, there's a, there's a small group of foreign policy experts who think it's a deeply flawed strategy. And I'm one of those people, right? I, I think that liberal hegemony is a prescription for disaster, and I'll make that clear as we go along here, right? Uh, but we've never gotten much traction. And to the extent that anybody's gotten any traction, and I'll talk more about this, it's Donald Trump, because you understand Donald Trump ran against the blob. And he got elected in part because American foreign policy is a disaster zone. Regarding the pursuit of liberal hegemony, just for background purposes here, between 1990 and 2000, you can argue that we did pretty well with liberal hegemony. I would argue against that, but you can make a pretty good case that that was the heyday of liberal hegemony. And since 2000, and certainly since 2001, everything has gone south. Uh, and the $64,000 question that's on the table today is what went wrong? You know, why is American foreign policy in so much trouble? Why was Donald Trump able to run against liberal hegemony? And he ran against almost every element of the liberal hegemonist agenda and get elected. Right? That's, that is the big question. And my argument is that liberalism is doomed as a foreign policy because nationalism and realism 
are more powerful forces and they undermine liberal hegemony at every turn. And if you think about it, focusing on what happens when a state pursues a liberal foreign policy and liberal hegemony in particular allows me to analyze the relationship between the three isms. So this is how I figured out how to write a book that dealt with the relationship between liberalism, nationalism, and realism by asking the simple question, why is liberal hegemony a flawed foreign policy? So in a very important way, the organizing question in the book is why was liberal hegemony doomed to fail? And the answer is in large part because of nationalism and realism. And in the process of laying this all out, I deal with those three isms. So I solved my problem, but it took me a couple of years. My approach. My approach, and this will become clear as we go along, is to drill down deep and to try to understand liberalism at its roots. Uh, and what I really want to know to begin with are what are its starting assumptions about human nature? I, I've worked very hard here, and this will become clear as I go along, which is not to say people have to agree with me, to sort of figure out what the bedrock is that liberalism is based on, and then figure out the principal elements of liberalism, and then try to understand liberalism as a political ideology for a particular country independent of how it works in the realm of foreign policy. So what I tried to do was not get wrapped around the axle about how liberalism applies to foreign policy. I just tried to figure out what the heck is this thing called liberalism? How do I think about it? And of course, in the process, as I'm thinking about liberalism, I'm trying to think about how it relates to nationalism and realism. And this is the table of contents of the book. Uh, Chapter one is the introduction, so you don't have to pay much attention to that. But chapter two is on human nature. Chapter three is on political liberalism. That's liberalism inside the black box. That's liberalism as a political system in a country. And then chapter four is cracks in the liberal edifice. Those are tensions, potential problems with liberalism. And then it's not till chapter five that I get to foreign policy. So what I've done here is I've written a book that has eight chapters and I don't deal with IR or foreign policy until the fifth chapter. A number of IR friends who have read the manuscript don't like it really because they say, what are you wasting all your time talking about human nature and talking about liberalism as a political ideology? Who cares, right? I want to go right to IR. And the view that I have, which I'm going to try and lay out tonight and in the next two lectures, is that you really have to understand liberalism at its core to understand how it applies to foreign policy. Now, uh, ooh, sorry. I want to say a few words about me and liberalism and then a few words about me and nationalism. I, I distinguish between liberalism at home and liberalism abroad. And I thank my lucky stars that I was born and raised in a liberal democracy called the United States of America. I'm not anti-liberal. Uh, one of the great paradoxes in this business is virtually all of the realists that I know are liberals in every way. Morgenthau, Waltz, these guys were, in terms of their domestic politics, they were liberals par excellence. Right. But they thought liberalism as a foreign policy was a prescription for trouble. And that's my basic view. My basic view is you have to think about liberalism at home versus liberalism abroad. So I'm not arguing that liberalism in general is a bad thing. I like liberal democracy very much. It's, it's not perfect by any means, but I'm glad I live in a liberal democracy. My arguments are all about liberalism when it applies <coughs> abroad. I want to say about a few words about me and nationalism. Nationalism is, uh, in my opinion, the most powerful political ideology on the planet. Uh, it's no accident that 
the world is populated by really nothing but nation states and nation states embody nationalism. Uh, and I think at the same time, it's very important to understand that at universities, especially places like Yale and the University of Chicago, nationalism is a bad word. I'm always amazed at how my colleagues at the University of Chicago really loathe nationalism. It just, it really rubs them the wrong way. And I understand that nationalism has a dark side to it. It has an upside as well, it has a dark side. Uh, but nationalism and liberalism, and this will become clear as we go along, are two different animals. Liberalism, as I'll try to make clear tonight, is all about internationalism. And universities are very international. And to illustrate this, I have a quote from Jonathan Holloway, who is the dean of Yale College, that was recently in the Washington Post. This is a story in the Washington Post called, The Surge in Foreign Students May Be Crowding Americans Out of Elite Colleges. That was the title of the article. And this was Mr. Holloway's comment. We want to bring together an incredibly diverse student body, diverse in every way. If we want to train the next generation, and here are the key words, of global leaders, we better have the globe here. Just think about what this is saying. Right? This is an internationalist version of the world. And this is, of course, what university is all about. And I'm perfectly content to operate in this world. I would not want universities to become more nationalist. Right? I think the fact that universities are internationalist is wonderful. And I really don't consider myself much of a nationalist, although I'm going to make the argument that virtually every American is a nationalist. Right? I don't consider myself a nationalist in a deep-seated way. Right? But I think in large part that's due to the fact that I've operated in the academy for so long. And the academy is very internationalist in nature and is very uncomfortable with the concept of nationalism. But the point that I'm going to make here is that the United States is a very nationalist country. It's one of the reasons that Donald Trump got elected president. He fully understands that. He fully understands that. And if Donald Trump ever saw this and gave a 15-minute tirade on what the dean said and what the title of that article said, he'd make a lot of hay of it. He really would, right? So I just want to be clear that with regard to liberalism, I'm talking about liberalism abroad, not liberalism at home. And with regard to nationalism, I'm not making the argument that nationalism is this wonderful force all the time. Okay, roots of liberal hegemony. This is the talk tonight. As I said, you got to start with human nature. Remember, that was my chapter two. And when you talk about human nature, really what you're asking is, what are those common traits that all individuals have in common? And by the way, this is something that the founding fathers of liberalism paid enormous attention to. Right? And I believe that if you're going to think about liberalism and nationalism, you have to wrestle with these questions. And there are two big questions. The first question is, are men and women social beings above all else, or does it make more sense to emphasize their individuality? In other words, are humans fundamentally social animals who strive hard to car carve out room for their individuality, <coughs> or are they individuals who form social contracts? That's question number one. Question number two, second, have our critical faculties developed to the point where we can reach universal consensus on what defines the good life? Can we agree on first principles? Can we use reason? Are we able to reason our way through collectively and come to meaningful agreement on the big questions about life? Those are sort of the two big issues on the table when you think about human nature. Now, my views on this subject are that human beings are primarily social animals. 
Uh, we're born into societies, we're born into groups, and we are heavily socialized inside those groups, both by the family and the society around us, in a really big way before our individuali individuality really gets to assert itself. Uh, I think human beings are very tribal, to put it in simplistic terms, from the get-go. It's not to say that you can't have a lot of individualism, but we're primarily social animals. And secondly, I think it's impossible to come close to reaching a universal consensus on questions about the good life. I mean, all you have to do is think about religion. Uh, do we have anything approximating a consensus on religion? Uh, can you use your critical faculties to prove to me that Catholicism is superior to Protestantism or Protestantism is superior to Catholicism? And then we can throw in all the other religions or what if you're an atheist? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, and you could point to all sorts of other examples. Uh, why does it matter so much who's, who's appointed to the Supreme Court? Why do we really care about that? because we know it's the judge's opinions, the judge's personal opinions that determines what the rulings are when you're dealing with hard cases that reach the Supreme Court. That's why the Republicans care so much and the Democrats care so much. There's no truth, there's no universal agreement. I mean, there are people like Ronald Dworkin who push in that direction, but they're outliers among legal theorists. Right, uh, and uh, even at universities, do we teach moral principles? Do we have a body of moral principles that we teach to students? I don't think so. What we do is expose students to all sorts of different perspectives. We have no agreement on first principles. There are a few things that we agree on, but even if we do agree, once you get outside the university, once you get outside the United States, the idea that you're gonna generate meaningful agreement Agreement on what's the best political system, liberal democracy. Go to Russia today and ask people what they think of liberal democracy. 1990s, that's what liberal democracy is for them. They'll take stability every time over liberal democracy. So there's no real consensus here. This is my view. And what about liberals? The liberal take on human nature is that humans are basically atomistic, individuals, the basic story. Uh, they operate as individuals in the state of nature. You know the basic story that Hobbes, who's not a liberal, but laid out many of the founding principles of liberalism makes and that John Locke makes, that individuals are atomistic in the state of nature and uh, they come together and they form a social contract so that the individual comes before the social. And then, of course, liberals believe that it's impossible to come close to reaching a universal consensus on questions about the good life. Right. So I agree with the liberal position with regard to the second question, but I disagree uh, on the first question. Whereas liberals think individuals come before society, I think the opposite. Now, if you put the two liberal assumptions together about human nature, what you end up is a world where individuals will sometimes have vehement disagreements about first principles. Right? Once you agree that individuals cannot reach a consensus on first principles, and first principles involve hot button issues, You then are in a situation where those disagreements might be so profound that you'll have violent conflict. So what this tells me is that the potential for mortal conflict sits at the root of liberalism. And this, of course, in the Hobbes story and even in the Locke story is why you leave the state of nature. And the reason that you want to create a state, you know the rest of the story. Right. But the point that I'm making to you here is when you look at the two bedrock assumptions 
about individuality and about the ability of people to use their critical faculties to answer the big questions of life, and you look at the liberal perspective and you put those two assumptions together, you get significant potential for conflict. And then the question becomes, how do you prevent conflict? How do you set up a liberal society so as to avoid conflict? I just put that up there because it's important to emphasize that when liberalism got its start, it was in large part concerned with the consequences of the Reformation, which was that Catholics and Protestants fought bloody wars in countries all over Europe. And again, the limits of reason show you that you can't answer which religion is superior, but at the same time, there's no question that people are profoundly attached to Catholicism and hate Protestantism and vice versa. So how, how do you deal with that problem? This again is the problem that liberalism faces. My argument is is a liberal solution. It has three parts. First is inalienable rights. Second is tolerance. And second is the Night Watchman case. This is the hard core of liberalism. I'm going to make some additional points about differences among liberals in a few minutes. But when you talk about the liberal solution to the problem of conflict, there are sort of three elements that come together to, in effect, dampen conflict. The first is the concept of inalienable rights. What this says that is that every individual on the planet has a set of rights. It could be life, liberty, and property, so forth and so on. But every individual on the planet has a set of rights that are inalienable, that nobody can take away from that person. And inalienable rights are of enormous importance for solving this problem. Because, for example, if somebody has the right to life, that means you can't kill that person. Somebody has liberty, life, liberty, pursuit of property, all these rights. Everybody has those rights, and you're not supposed to interfere with them. And the second is the norm of tolerance. That should be a two and a three. The norm of tolerance. And tolerance in large part grows out of this emphasis on rights because if, other, if everybody has rights and rights to think their own way, right, you in effect should be tolerant. So liberal societies place a very high premium on tolerance. Right? in addition to rights, and again, the tolerance is inextricably linked with the rights. Once you have inalienable rights, there's going to be a big emphasis on tolerance. But the problem is, because of the vehemence of the disputes, and the fact that there is a tendency for people, when they really disagree, to want to kill each other, tolerance is not going to be enough. And therefore, you need a state to act as a night watchman. Right? Liberals believe that you need a state. It's very clear that liberals have a mixed set of feelings about the state, in large part because a powerful state can threaten the individual's rights. But at the same time, virtually all liberals understand that you need a state, and you need a state to act as a night watchman. Because again, just to go back to square one, you have individuals out there who have profound differences about terribly important issues. And the question is, how do you prevent people from killing each other? And again, you emphasize rights, you emphasize tolerance, but those two things together are not enough. You need a state as well. Now, this begins to morph into the IR issue, and I, I want to just take a few minutes to lay this out without getting into the international relations dimension of things. The focus on the individual and his or her inalienable rights turns liberalism into a universalistic or universalist ideology. There's, in other words, there's this dimension in liberalism that grows out of its 
emphasis on the individual that makes it universal. What liberalism is saying is that every person on the planet has the same rights. Those rights are universal. They apply to everybody. If you focus on social groups, if you believe that human beings are social animals first and foremost, you end up with a particularist ideology like nationalism. So nationalism doesn't focus on individuals, it focuses on the group. And there is your group, and then there is the other. Right. It's a particularist ideology. That's not what liberalism is all about. Liberalism focuses on the individual. And once you focus on the individual, you quickly end up with a universalist ideology when you throw in inalienable rights. And of course, when you start thinking about liberal hegemony, just to get ahead of myself, when the rights of people outside the borders of the United States are violated, there's a very powerful temptation to go abroad. Now, take this a step further. There are two kinds of political liberalism. Uh, one is classical or modus vivendi liberalism, and the other is modern or progressive liberalism. Uh, I got this distinction mainly from the writings of John Gray. For anybody who's interested, he's written a book called Two Faces of Liberalism, which is an excellent book that lays this out. And Alan Ryan has also written an important essay that lays this out. Uh, so what you have is you have modus, what I call modus vivendi <coughs> liberalism and, and progressive liberalism. And, and these are the two different forms of liberalism that we want to think about. And the story I'm going to tell as we go along here is that progressive liberalism has trumped mod modus vivendi liberalism. We, we, we live in a world where progressive liberalism dominates, and I'll lay that story out. Before I go on to unpacking what modus vivendi liberalism and progressive liberalism are, I just want to say that I distinguish liberalism from utilitarianism and from liberal idealism. Uh, utilitarianism is identified with people like Jeremy Bentham, uh, and Jeremy Bentham hated the emphasis on inalienable rights. He said it was nonsense. Uh, and utilitarians and liberals tend to be at each other's throats in all sorts of ways. If you look at the debates between Ronald Dworkin and Richard Posner, uh, both famous legal theorists, Dworkin is very much a progressive liberal and Posner is very much a utilitarian and they bark at each other using the language of utilitarian and liberal. Uh, if you look at John Rawls, John Rawls frequently is barking against or barking about uh, utilitarians. So I'm not talking about utilitarians when I talk about liberals. For those of you who do IR in the audience and have read E.H. Carr, E.H. Carr's attack on liberalism, which was written in the 1930s, is an attack on utilitarianism and on liberal idealism. It's not an attack on the liberalism I'm talking about. Carr and I are going after very different targets. Liberal idealism, by the way, is identified with people like T.H. Green and John Dewey. I won't go into any details on what exactly it is, but it's a very different animal than the liberalism I'm talking about. And I'm not saying these two are irrelevant or not worth studying, but not what I'm looking at. I'm looking at progressive liberalism and modus vivendi liberalism, both of which focus in large part on rights. Okay. Now I want to do is, I want to distinguish between these two kinds of liberalism, right? And you want to remember that this is the hard core. So there's no question that both progressives and modus vivendi liberals emphasize those three elements. Now, in distinguishing between the two kinds of liberalism, first point I would make is it's not a difference that's based on reason. There are actually some progressive liberals who make the argument that we can use our critical faculties 
to figure out questions about the good life. And actually, the piece that comes the closest to making this argument is Francis Fukuyama's very famous piece uh, on the end of history. If you go back and read Francis Fukuyama's piece after listening to my talk tonight, what Francis Fukuyama is basically saying in that piece is that with the end of the Cold War, we've reached the end of history. We're not going to have any more conflict. We're not going to have any more war because we're not going to have any more disagreement on big questions. He's basically saying liberal democracy won, and from here on out, the planet is going to be covered by more and more liberal democracies until we have nothing but liberal democracies. And liberal democracies never have anything to fight over. It's all been settled. That's his argument. But he's really the only person who makes that argument. And if you look at his book, he backtracks in the book. Okay. Uh, so uh, my initial inclination when I started studying liberalism was to think that there was a difference between progressive liberals and modus vivendi liberals that involved reason. But I don't believe that anymore. I think there are two big differences. The first big difference is between negative and positive rights and the desirability and efficacy of social engineering. Now you're saying to yourself, what exactly is he talking about? When we talk about negative rights, we're talking about you know, liberty. We're talking about freedom from state interference. We're talking about free speech, freedom of assembly the right to property, right? This is where you have a state that just protects your freedoms, right? Positive rights are where the state actually interferes to guarantee that you enjoy rights that are inalienable. And I think the best example of this, and I'll talk more about it as we go along, is the right to equal opportunity. If you look at uh, John Rawls and you look at Ronald Dworkin, they talk a great deal about justice. And justice for them is all about equal opportunity. And equal opportunity is where the state comes in and it levels the playing field. It's not equal outcomes, it's equal opportunity. Right. And needless to say, if you believe in positive rights, you're going to believe in the desirability of social engineering. Because there's no way you can put positive rights into effect without doing a lot of social engineering. So just to get ahead of myself a bit, if you're doing negative rights only, right, all you want is a state as a night watchman. Here we go. Modus vivendi liberals. Modus vivendi liberals. This is Friedrich Hayek. For anybody who really wants to sort of read a canonical version of modus vivendi liberalism, read Friedrich Hayek. I think Locke fits in the same rough category. Negative rights over positive rights. Modus vivendi or classical liberals really dislike positive rights. I think it's fair to say Hayek hates positive rights. He thinks the state should not be doing social engineering. They loathe social engineering. They make the argument, almost all of them, that not only is it not desirable, but we're not good at it. And that's why we shouldn't do it. You know all the arguments. Republicans make these arguments all the time, that we should let the market decide how to solve problem X or solve problem Y, because markets are much more efficient than the state. When the state gets involved doing anything, it bollockses it up. That's the classical liberal, the modus vivendi liberal view. Progressive liberals, on the other hand, they believe in negative rights, because everybody believes you need the night watchman to protect those liberties. But progressive liberals also believe that it's very important for the state to get involved, to do social engineering, to create a level playing field. Right? There are all these positive rights. It's like, just, just think about medical care or health care. Do we believe in health care 
in the United States? I think the answer is yes. I think if you look at the Republicans, they can't just kill Obamacare. They have to replace Obamacare. Because I think we've reached the point, and I could go into this greater detail in the Q&A if people want, we've reached the point where basically everybody believes that people have a right to universal health care, a right to health care. Right? But once you start talking about a right to health care, you're talking about positive rights. Right? The state's involved in social engineering. And of course, this is why Republicans dislike Obamacare, because the Republicans talk like classical liberals, although I'll make the argument in the short time that they act like progressive liberals. You see, that's the difference between modus vivendi liberals and progressive liberals. It's not that one believes that you can use your critical faculties to reach conclusions about first principles and the other doesn't. I thought that initially, but no. I think that modus vivendi liberals and progressive liberals have a difference about rights, right? They have a difference about rights and a difference on social engineering. Now, my argument is that with the passage of time, progressive liberalism has trumped modus vivendi liberalism or classical liberalism. Not at the rhetorical level, but in practice. And let me just say a little bit about this. Uh, we have in the United States a remarkably powerful state that intervenes in almost all aspects of our life. It's involved in heavy duty social engineering. And there's no way you can get around that. And the Republicans, just to talk about this in some detail, the Republicans constantly talk about how terrible this is and how they want to change things. And how when they get elected, we're going to let the market do this and we're going to stop the government from doing that. We're going to get out of the business of doing social engineering. But if you look at how Republicans behave in contrast to Democrats, there's hardly any difference at all. There's no evidence that Democrats spend more money on social engineering than Republicans do. There's no evidence that Democrats create more institutions than Republicans do. The Republicans created the Department of Homeland Security. The Republicans created the Environmental Protection Agency. Ronald Reagan spent one heck of a lot more money on social issues than Barack Obama did. And even in cases where Democrats outspent Republicans, you look at different presidents, it's by tiny margins. So there's just not much difference at all. Uh, there is one political party in the United States that actually truly believes in modus vivendi liberalism. Uh, it's represented by the Libertarian Party. The Libertarians are classical liberals or modus vivendi liberals. No single, no single Libertarian has ever been elected to Congress and in the 2016 presidential election, the Libertarian received a little over 3% of the vote. So the idea that we have a political party that really represents modus vivendi liberalism and stands a chance of winning is erroneous. It, it's impossible. The Republican Party and the Democratic Party, despite all the rhetoric, are deeply committed to progressive liberalism. That's to say they're deeply committed to social engineering and they're deeply committed to positive rights. You can make the argument that the Democratic Party is more committed than the Republican Party to positive rights, maybe so. But the Republican Party is also committed to positive rights. Now why is this the case? It really all began at least in the United States in the late 1800s. And it's a function of three things. One is the Industrial Revolution, two is nationalism, and three is these huge wars that we fight. Just on the Industrial Revolution, what happened when the United, when the United States really uh, was hit hard with the Industrial Revolution in the late 19th, early 20th century is you had these huge industrial enterprises that came online uh, that did certain things 
uh, that had huge consequences for people all over the United States and indeed for people all over the planet. And it became very obvious to politicians at the time. And here we're talking about Republicans because you understand that the original progressives in the United States were not Democrats. They were mainly Republicans. Herbert Hoover was a social engineer par excellence. Teddy Roosevelt was a social engineer par excellence, right? And uh, the reason was that you had to manage this economy. You had to manage these huge industries and figure out rules and regulations. You had all sorts of labor unions, labor problems, child labor problems, and so forth and so on that had to be managed by the state. There's no way you could avoid that. And then, of course, when you start fighting wars, whether it's the American Civil War, World War I, World War II, uh, the state gets involved not only in running those wars, but when the wars are over with, you have to do all sorts of social engineering to reward the people who fought the wars. You remember the GI Bill? The GI Bill is a perfect example of a positive right. It's social engineering. I could go on and on about this. Right. And then there's nationalism, of course, which I'll talk much more about next time. Right. When you start thinking about nationalism, what happens is that the state has all sorts of reasons to want to organize people down below for administrative reasons, for economic reasons, for military reasons. The state gets in the business of doing social engineering in a big way. Right. When you think about nationalism, the state is interested in creating a coherent nation and it wants that nation to be loyal to the state. That involves doing all sorts of things of an administrative nature, again, of an economic nature and a military nature. And of course, with nationalism, people in the nation have a certain loyalty to the state. This is the nation state. The nation has loyalty to the state. And the end result of that is that the state is expected to do things for the nation, for the people. And of course, if you're in a liberal democracy like the United States, politicians who promise to do all sorts of things for people tend to get elected over those who promise not to do big things for people. So in a liberal nation state like the United States that undergoes the Industrial Revolution and then fights big wars, for all those reasons, you move into a world where progressive liberalism dominates. And again, progressive liberalism is all about positive rights and it's about social engineering. So here's the modern liberal template. Core assumptions, individualism, no universal agreement on first principles. Okay, those are the two starting assumptions I had about human nature. Second, Progressive liberalism has triumphed, and with progressive liberalism, you get negative and positive and alienable rights. Those are inalienable rights, those positive rights as well as those negative rights. You get tolerance, and you get a state that engages in social engineering. That's the basic liberal story. Now, how does this apply to IR, just to get ahead of myself? There are two very important dimensions to this story. One, I've already emphasized, and that's the individualism, right? It's the individualism and the inalienable rights that creates the universalist dimension. Cannot underestimate the importance of this. Liberals, and this is certainly true in countries like the United States and Britain, tend to see people who live in other countries as having the same rights as them. And because they place such a high premium on rights, liberalism is all about rights, really matter. When the rights of those people are being violated in a serious way, needless to say, it's gonna create a very powerful incentive to see if you can fix that problem. And if you're the United States of America and you are super powerful, it's not surprising that you're going to be at least tempted to fix the problem, right? So again, that focus on individualism is so important, right? Married to inalienable rights. 
The second thing that really matters for the international relations dimension of my story is the social engineering. Once you accept the fact that progressive liberalism has triumphed and that we live in a world where liberals are committed to social engineering. And by the way, even if you weren't a liberal, you'd have to be committed to social engineering, just given the complexities of, moderns, uh, of the modern world. Whether it's a liberal state or not, it's going to be an interventionist state at home. But this liberal state called the United States is heavily into social engineering. But if you're into social engineering at home, it doesn't take long before you think you can do social engineering abroad. I remember the Iraq war, which I adamantly and publicly opposed before it happened. And I would say to people, do you seriously believe that you're going to go into Iraq and do social engineering in a country that you really don't understand? We can't even do social engineering at home, much less in a foreign country. But I'll tell you, those boys and girls who took us in, they were very confident that they could do social engineering. They're Americans. These were skill thinkers. These were people who knew how to do business, right? So we went traipsing into Iraq. And of course, you know what happened, which is what I'll talk about next time, right? But the point is, when you unpack the liberal story, right, what you see is this. Next lecture. Next lecture, what I want to do is I want to explain the logic behind liberal hegemony. I've obviously told you part of the story, but I want to unpack it in even greater detail. In other words, the story tonight is basically about liberalism and its roots and liberalism as a political ideology inside a state. Right? I want to explain liberal hegemony. Then I want to provide evidence that it does not work as advertised. Indeed, it leads to untold trouble. I want to talk about NATO expansion. NATO expansion was liberal hegemony at work. Nothing to do with realism. I want to talk about the Bush Doctrine in the Middle East. And I want to just show you how much trouble we've had. And then I want to explain why liberal hegemony fails. I want to explain what went wrong with NATO expansion. I want to explain what went wrong in the greater Middle East, right? And of course, you're not going to be surprised to hear that my story is all about how nationalism and realism thwart liberalism. That's my basic story. And of course, all of this is to say that I, in a very interesting way, ended up, in the end, dealing with nationalism, realism, and liberalism, and comparing those three isms. Although when I started the book, I couldn't figure out a way to do that. Here at the end, I did it. Now, whether I succeeded or not, you'll tell me tonight and on Wednesday and on Thursday. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. Apologies for the delay. I think it's in everybody's comfort, interest to be more comfortable here. My name is Nuno Montero. I'm the Director of International Security Studies here and the Associate Professor of Political Science. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor John J. Mearsheimer from the University of Chicago, who happened to be my dissertation advisor back <laughs> before the meteor came and killed all the dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> this is the second of his three lectures here. Today's, the, all the lectures are on the topic of liberal dreams and international realities. Today's lecture will be titled uh, The False Promise of Liberal Hegemony, and is to be followed by tomorrow, the lecture at the same time uh, in uh, room 203 tomorrow, notice the change in room, also upstairs, but the other room. Tomorrow's lecture is titled The Case for Restraint, and it will be followed by a reception. We hope to see you here again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Nuno, and thank you again to Ian for inviting me to give the Stimson lectures. It's truly a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's also an honor to deliver these lectures at an august institution like Yale. 
Uh, I also, uh, as a good Marxist in the Groucho Marx sense of the term, I'm <laughs> deeply humbled that so many people turned out to hear me talk that we had to change the venue. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope I can deliver a lecture that makes it all worth it. Uh, as Nuno said, tonight I'm going to talk about the false promise of liberal hegemony. For those of you who were here on Monday night, you know that what I did was I really talked about liberalism uh, and didn't say much about foreign policy. This is the first of my two talks uh, tonight and tomorrow night that really do with the international dimension of liberalism. The first uh, talk was all about just sort of getting at the essence of liberalism. Uh, the outline for tonight is that I'd like to start by defining what I mean by liberal hegemony and explain to you why states pursue it. Then I'd like to explain when states pursue liberal hegemony. So the first part will deal with the why, the second part is when. And then in the third part, I want to talk about what it looks like in practice, and then finally explain to you why it is prone to fail disastrously. So the first part of the talk is on the subject of what is liberal hegemony. Uh, just a few words about its policy relevance, then what I really want to do is talk about its theoretical underpinnings. With regard to its policy relevance, I think almost everybody who studies IR in my world agrees that it has been the foreign policy of the United States since the Cold War ended, that the United States has pursued liberal hegemony. Uh, and for those who have any doubts, the argument usually goes that it wasn't really true up until 2001, but clearly it was true after 2001. But most people agree that during the entire Cold War period, it has been uh, the foreign policy of choice. And moreover, it's a f foreign policy that the American elite loves. Uh, as I said the other night, we sometimes refer to the American foreign policy establishment as the blob. This is Ben Rhodes's terminology, Ben Rhodes who worked for Barack Obama. Uh, the blob is deeply wedded to liberal hegemony and it includes both Republicans and Democrats. There's this myth in the land, mainly pervaded by Republicans, that Republicans and Democrats have very different views on foreign policy. This is poppycock. It's Tweedledee and Tweedledum, right? And they love their, uh, they love their liberal hegemony. Donald Trump is an exception. He ran against liberal hegemony. And where he ends up remains to be seen. But uh, he ran against it. Now, a little bit about the analytical foundation of liberal hegemony, and this grows out of my discussion from last time. As I said to you, liberalism is at its root a political philosophy that focuses on the individual and places enormous emphasis on inalienable rights. Inalienable meaning they apply to everybody and they cannot be taken away. And the point I made last time, and I'd like to emphasize again tonight, is when you marry that sense of individualism with inalienable rights, you get a universalist ideology. Right? And the point I made last time, and make again here, is that, you, is that liberal hegemony, or even liberalism, when it applies to foreign policy, has this universalist dimension that is of great importance. And what it means in terms of a broad foreign policy goal is that you quickly become consumed with spreading liberal democracy across the globe. That emphasis on inalienable rights, which leads to universalism, produces a foreign policy that emphasizes the spreading of liberal democracy. And there are three reasons for that. This really gets to the heart and soul of the argument, and I'll unpack them all, but just put them up in laundry list fashion right now. You want to spread democracy for three reasons. One, to protect human rights across the world. 
two, to cause international peace, and three, to protect liberalism at home. And again, all of this grows out of the emphasis on individualism and inalienable rights, as I'll make clear as we go along here. So let me start by talking about protecting human rights across the world. The basic argument is that people who live in a far off country are no different than people who live in your country. Borders actually don't matter very much. Rights are of great importance and everybody has rights. And when the rights of non-Americans are being threatened, Americans have a responsibility to do everything they can to protect those people whose rights are being violated. And of course the most important here, important right here is the right to life. If some foreign dictator is murdering large numbers of his or her people, the United States has a responsibility that grows out of this universalism to protect the rights of those individuals that are being violated. Now, this goes so far in the liberal discourse that you end up getting the argument that non-liberal governments are in a state of aggression with their own people. Just think about that statement. This is Michael Doyle, mainstream, prominent, liberal international relations theorist at Columbia University. He's basically saying non-liberal governments, no matter what they do, non-liberal governments are in a state of aggression with their own people. What happens here is that you go from a situation where you can use your military forces to intervene in different countries when there are gross violations of individual rights and fix the problem and then leave. You, you go from that more modest policy to one where you decide that the best way to protect rights is simply to turn another country into a liberal democracy. Because once it's a liberal democracy, the individual rights, which are privileged in liberalism, are protected by definition. So if you have a planet that is filled with nothing but liberal democracies, the problem of gross violations of human rights is simply taken off the table. If you merely just act like a fire department and you only intervene in those situations where you see rights being violated, you fix it and then you get out, you don't ultimately solve the problem. So what this emphasis on protecting rights does, especially when it's taken in the form that Michael Doyle lays out, it leads to the belief that what you want to do is populate the planet with liberal democracies. Second reason to spread liberal democracy, it leads to international peace. Virtually everybody in this audience, I'm sure, knows all about democratic peace theory. Democratic peace theory is based on the basic liberal template involving rights and tolerance, right? It's the whole idea that people across the planet have a set of inalienable rights and that they tend to respect the rights of other individuals, right? And that leads to international peace, right? If you can spread democracy across the planet. In other words, if you create a world of all democracies, they're not going to fight against each other because people respect the rights of people in other countries and they're tolerant. The tolerance grows out of that emphasis on inalienable rights, as I talked about last time. This is basic democratic peace theory and this is the basic liberal logic that underpins it. Right? Moreover, 
it solves the twin problems of nuclear proliferation and terrorism. Right? If you have peace, you don't need nuclear weapons. There's no need for, global, for, for nuclear weapons in a world where there's nothing but liberal democracies. And terrorism is certainly not going to be a problem because in the liberal story, liberal states never engage in terrorism. It's always non-liberal states. So the idea is to create a world where they're just liberal democracies. And this is the rationale for invading Iraq. Sometimes people will say to me, John, how can you say that invading Iraq uh, was based on a liberal theory? Well, the invasion of Iraq and the Bush doctrine more generally, as I'll make clear as we go along here, was based on the assumption that if you could go into Iraq, go into Iran, go into Syria, you could turn the greater Middle East into a sea of democracies. You could turn them into a sea of democracies, cause peace, there would be no nuclear proliferation, and there would be no terrorism. That's what they thought would be the end result. This is why the Bush administration thought that Al-Qaeda itself was not the problem. Al-Qaeda was part of the problem, but rogue states in the Middle East, rogue states meaning non-democracies that don't dance to America's tune, have to be turned into liberal democracies. So once that happens, then you turn the Middle East into a zone of peace. And oh, by the way, this is exactly what happened in Europe, according to the liberal story. Why do we have peace in Europe? Because it's filled with liberal democracies. And I'll talk more about this in the context of NATO expansion. They don't fight each other. You don't get terrorism. You don't get nuclear proliferation. Third, oh, let me, yeah, just on the business of international peace. Uh, what you also see in the literature on uh, liberal democracy as a cause of peace is a tremendous emphasis on the word community, especially international community. You surely have all heard the word international community many times. International community is very much a liberal term. Think about the opposite of international. It's national. When the journal journal International Security was created, there was a huge debate about whether to call it national security or international security. And they called it international security, right? International, right? And it's the international community giving you the sense that there are really no meaningful borders among the states that exist in that community. Those borders are very porous. We talk about the transatlantic community. We talk about the European community, the EC. We went from the European steel and coal community to the European community to the European Union, right? But the European community. We talk about security communities. Carl Deutsch's famous term. Woodrow Wilson used to talk about communities of power, right? And of course, in these communities, you're not going to have any war. That's the basic argument. Third reason to spread liberal democracy uh, is to protect liberalism at home. Uh, the fact is that virtually every liberal theorist understands that you're not going to convince every single person in a liberal society that liberalism is the ideal political system. And there's always a danger on the home front that uh, uh, there'll be a group that is powerful and will attempt to overthrow the liberal order. And what really scares liberals is the thought that that group on the home front will form an alliance with a foreign country. And that foreign country will help fuel revolution at home. Okay? So if you live in a world of all liberal democracies, that problem is taken off the table. That's reflected in Woodrow Wilson's famous words. He went before Congress on April 2nd, 1917, to ask for a declaration of war against Germany. And that's where he made his famous remarks that his aim was to help create a world that could be made safe for democracy. A world that could be made safe for democracy. Because he understood that liberal democracy sometimes exists in a tenuous state. Just to give you two other examples of this. The United States and the Red Scares after both World War I and during the early Cold War. What was the basic fear here? 
the basic fear was that there were communists in the United States and those communists would lie with a communist state like the Soviet Union and the end result of that would be trouble, if not revolution, on the home front. So if you can create a situation where you turn the Soviet Union into a liberal democracy, you turn communist China into a liberal democracy, you just take that problem right off the table. And think about the problem today from China and Russia's point of view. What China and Russia today fear is that liberal groups and individuals inside those countries who are unhappy with the likes of Vladimir Putin will ally with the United States to undermine the regime. You go to Moscow today, you go to Beijing today, they are really worried about regime change. As hard as that may, to be believe, that may be to believe, regime change instigated by the United States in an alliance with liberal forces inside their own countries. And again, if the United States was not a liberal country, this problem would be taken off the table. So, the underpinnings of liberal hegemony. Emphasis on individualism plus inalienable rights gives it a powerful universalist impulse. And that impulse leads to a foreign policy committed to spreading liberal democracy around the world for those three reasons. When do states pursue liberal hegemony? This is the second big question. My argument is it depends largely on the structure of the system. It depends largely on whether or not the system is bipolar, multipolar, or unipolar. Uh, if it's bipolar or multipolar, in other words, there are, if there are two or more great powers in the system, states cannot pursue liberal hegemony. They have to act according to balance of power logic. And in a minute, I'm going to explain to you why that is completely consistent with liberal theory. But just for now, understand that my argument is when there are two or more great powers, each of those great powers has to worry about the other great power and therefore has to worry about the balance of power and has to act according to balance of power logic. In a unipolar system where there is a single great power, a single great power, this is the United States, of course, when the Cold War ends, you can pursue liberal hegemony because you don't have to worry about the balance of power because there is effectively no balance of power. You are Godzilla and you are free to do pretty much what you want. And, and you understand what's happening here. If you're Godzilla and you have this liberal impulse hardwired into you, you know what you're going to do. You're going to try and create democracy all over the world. I'll say more about that in a second. But unipolarity is where you get liberal hegemony. And as I said, this is consistent with the liberal formula for dealing with conflict. Remember what I said last time, liberalism at its root is a theory of conflict. Liberals assume that you have individuals and those individuals cannot agree on first principles in all cases. And sometimes the disagreement over first principles is so powerful that people want to kill each other. And that is why you need the night watchman state. There's no liberal theorist who says you don't need a state. The three-part solution or formula for preventing conflict is number one, inalienable rights. If everybody has rights and everybody has the right to life, not going to be a lot of killing if you can convince people of that. Furthermore, there's going to be a lot of tolerance. So purveying the norm of tolerance is very important in the liberal story. But all liberals understand that emphasizing rights and emphasizing tolerance, those two things together, is not enough. You need a night watchman state. Think about the state of nature. Liberals start in the state of nature where individuals are constantly in a situation where there's potential for conflict and death. And what they do is they form a social contract. 
and the social contract involves a higher authority. So you need that higher authority. There's no higher authority in international politics. There is no world state. There's no social contract, despite all this talk about community. Therefore, if you're surrounded by other great powers, you have no choice but to compete with them, according to liberal logic. Because according to liberal logic, without the night watchman state, you are back in the state of nature. The state of nature is anarchic. It's not hierarchic. The reason you form a state, a social contract, is to get out of anarchy. But you don't have that in international politics. And for that reason, when there are other great powers in the system, you have to compete with them, and you can't pursue liberal hegemony. But if you're in unipolarity, the imbalance is so great between Godzilla and all of the minions that Godzilla is free to pursue liberal hegemony. Right, that's the basic argument. They take this one step further. Bruno you know Montero, as you know, has written the seminal book on unipolarity. And he says in that book that the unipole has three options. If you think about it, these make perfect sense. First of all, the unipole can go home because it's so powerful and secure that it doesn't have to sweat what's going on in the rest of the world. You just go home. You won. We won the Cold War. We're Godzilla. Let's go home. Who's going to threaten us? And if the minions want to fight among themselves, who cares? That's one possibility. Second is you can stay involved abroad and use the power you have to maintain the status quo. Or number three, you can stay involved abroad and use that power to do social engineering on a grand scale. That, number three, is what Uncle Sam did. Because Uncle Sam has this liberal impulse hardwired into it. And it, of course, has the capability in terms of raw power. And as I pointed out to you last time, social engineering is at the heart of modern liberalism. Modern liberalism is all about social engineering. And modern liberals have great confidence in social engineering. So when you put the distribution of power this liberal DNA, which involves this universalist impulse and your belief in social engineering, you're off to the races. And that's exactly what happened after 1989. Talk a little bit about liberal hegemony in action. Uh, you get, as I just said, you get a super ambitious foreign policy. You also get a heavily militarized foreign policy. The United States is a militaristic state. Right? It's really quite remarkable. I'll talk more about this as we go along. We are addicted to war. Uh, and these are liberal-driven wars. I'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow. Me and my realist friends have been against almost every one of these wars. And it's my liberal friends who are pushing these wars. I have some liberal friends who have never seen a war they didn't want to fight. We have a highly militarized foreign policy. The United States has fought seven separate wars since the Cold War ended, and it's been at war for two out of every three years since 1989. This is remarkable. <laughs> Going back to Nuno's template, I thought we won the Cold War. We could go home and relax. We're so powerful. But no, no, no. That's not what we did. And we did it for liberal reasons. Liberal hegemony action. Two cases. Talk a little bit about NATO expansion. Uh, as you know, when the Cold War ended, shortly thereafter, in the Clinton administration, they began to talk about expanding NATO. And as I'll make clear as we go along here, this is the, one of the principal causes of the conflict with Russia over Ukraine. Uh, the first expansion was in 1999. We brought in Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. The second expansion was in 2004. We brought in the Baltic states, Romania, Slovenia, Slovakia, so forth and so on. Uh, and then after 2008, we were talking about bringing in Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, now, when 
Things blew up after the February 22nd, 2014 coup in Ukraine. When things blew up between us and the Russians, they took Crimea, so forth and so on. Everybody said the Russians are a threat to overrun Eastern Europe. The whole purpose of NATO expansion was to contain Russia. And thank goodness we were actually moving further and further into Eastern Europe. That's simply not true. That's simply not true. There's no evidence to support that argument. We were moving NATO eastward in large part as an element in a liberal strategy that was designed to take this security community, in the Deutschian sense of the term, that we had created in Western Europe during the Cold War and move it eastward. It included not only spreading NATO, it included spreading the European Union and promoting democracy. You all remember the Orange Revolution in Ukraine? And you remember the Rose Revolution in Georgia? This was all designed to take this security community and move it eastward. Michael McFall, who I've debated on this issue of the Ukraine crisis, who was the US ambassador to Russia from 2012 to right before the 2014 coup, says that I told Putin on numerous occasions and I told his lieutenants on numerous occasions that NATO expansion was not a threat to Russia. And he genuinely believed that. Barack Obama has said the same thing. He genuinely believed it. These people who were pushing NATO expansion did not believe in realpolitik and containment. In fact, they said that anyone who believes in realpolitik and containment, and that includes yours truly, is a 17th century person. That's right. We're dinosaurs. That world has gone away with the end of the Cold War. So NATO expansion was not motivated by realist logic. And by the way, virtually all the realists were opposed to NATO expansion and said, this is not going to have a happy ending. And George Kennan gave a famous interview to Thomas Friedman of the New York Times, who wrote it up. And Kennan said exactly that. This is unnecessary, and it's going to lead to big trouble. And surprise of surprises, it led to a war in August 2008 between Russia and Georgia. And in 2014, you ended up with a war between Russia and Ukraine over Ukraine. Right. But it was not driven by realist logic. Bush doctrine, you know, a lot of people will say what's going on in the Middle East, or the greater Middle East, is that we are uh, pursuing the American national interest in a realpolitik kind of way and just disguising our behavior with liberal rhetoric. Uh, in fact, if you look at what the Bush administration said, that's not true. And as I explained to you about the Iraq case, we went into Iraq for the purpose of turning it into a liberal democracy because we saw that as part of a story where there would be no more war in the Middle East. Once we got beyond Iraq and we got Syria involved and Iran involved and we democratized the entire place, it would all lead to peace, love and dope, and it would take terrorism and nuclear proliferation off the table. That was the basic view here of what we were up to. Uh, of course, it all crashed and burned, but, uh, uh, but that was the initial intention. And by the way, it was a remarkably ambitious foreign policy. I can think of no case in American history where we pursued a foreign policy that was as ambitious and foolish as this. The idea that we were going to democratize the Middle East, a region of the world that had hardly any history of democracy, at the end of a rifle barrel, really remarkable. And of course, who opposed that war? Mainly realists. Some liberals did, much to their credit, but mainly realists. Why is liberal hegemony doomed? Reason number one. Social engineering in foreign countries is an extremely difficult enterprise under the best of circumstances. Indeed, social engineering in one's own country is especially difficult. 
But the idea that we can go into a foreign country, we can go into a foreign country where most of the people don't speak the language, don't understand the culture, knock off the regime, right, and therefore create a lot of chaos, and then create order out of that chaos, and not just order out of that chaos, but create liberal democracy or even just democracy? This is a pipe dream. And using the U.S. military for that? I spent 10 years of my life in the U.S. military. I went to West Point. The U.S. military, the U.S. Army, these ground forces that we have, they're good at breaking things. They're good at killing people. They're giant killing machines. The idea that you could take the U.S. Army and send it into Iraq and that it is going to be able to do nation building or state building in a sophisticated way, it's not going to happen, I can guarantee you. You want to send him up against Saddam's army in the middle of the desert in 1991? You want to do that? That's Bambi versus Godzilla, right? That's what the U.S. Army or the U.S. Marines are good at doing, right? But you start talking about taking the American military, putting it in a place like Vietnam, putting it in a place like Afghanistan, and letting it do social engineering, not going to work, right? But I don't even care if you bring in experts, it's not going to work anyway. And if it does work, it's going to take you a heck of a long time. But there are three other reasons it's not going to work. <laughs> Second is, Nationalism is a remarkably powerful force. You've heard me say that on more than one occasion between the last lecture and this one. And it causes the target state to resist foreign intervention. I won't go into a long song and dance about what nationalism is all about. I'd love to do that. But let me just say, self-determination and sovereignty are at the heart of nationalism. Right? The people in a nation state the nation itself and the leaders who run a state, they want to determine for themselves uh, what their domestic politics look like, and they want to determine for themselves what their foreign policy looks like. Uh, this is what sovereignty is all about. Uh, and they don't want a foreign country, whether it's the United States or the Soviet Union going into Afghanistan or Britain going into Afghanistan, or France going into Vietnam. These people don't want foreigners running their politics. They don't want foreigners occupying their country. And who can blame them? As I point out here, think about the US outrage over claims that the Russians interfered in the 2016 election. Apparently, from reading the newspapers, this drives Americans crazy. The idea that the Russians interfered in our elections. Well, we interfere in elections all over the planet. We interfere in the politics of states all over the planet. We think we have a God-given right to go into any country, violate sovereignty, if it's done for just purposes, which means promoting liberal democracy. We have a rich history of it, as you know. But as my mother taught me when I was a little boy, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If we want if we're jealous gods when it comes to our sovereignty, don't you think that people in other countries are going to feel the same way? Don't you think the Vietnamese, after World War II, are going to want the French out? And then when the Americans replace the French, don't you think they're going to want us out? They are. You think the Afghanis are happy about us being there? You think that this is a long-term solution? Of course, you may believe we can do the necessary social engineering to fix the problem, getting back to my first point, don't bet on it. You understand that Afghanistan is the longest war in American history, and we have now spent quite a bit more money on fixing Afghanistan than we spent with the Marshall Plan. And look at the results. Not pretty. Reason number three. Individual rights, this whole concept of inalienable rights, are oversold. If you uh, uh, sort of look around the world at surveys and you look at a number of historical cases, what you see is that people generally think rights are important, but they don't privilege them to the extent that the theory says they should. And people will often sacrifice rights for stability. There's a lot of survey data that shows that this is true today in the Middle East. Hardly surprising. If you lived in one of those countries would you, that the United States has helped wreck, would you be interested, first and foremost, in 
creating liberal democracy or would you be interested first and foremost in creating some stability? I think the answer is quite clear. Go to Russia today. Right? First time I ever went to Russia, I talked to all sorts of people about this issue. How do you think about liberal democracy? Liberal democracy means one thing to them, the 1990s. Tried that, been there, and it was a total disaster. Thank God we have Putin. If he's not a liberal Democrat, and he is a semi-authoritarian leader, more power to him. That's the answer you hear most of the time. Can you blame them? But what this means is that liberal democracy is not always an easy sell. It's not like you're going abroad and everybody's out there just demanding liberal democracy. Oh my God, this is the most important political system in the world, and if we can just get it, we'll live happily ever after. This is not to say that there aren't many places where they would prefer liberal democracy over some semi-authoritarian system. There are cases like that. But the point is, it's not an easy sell. And then finally, some states actually act to balance against the unipole. They act according to realist logic. This certainly has been true with China and Russia, and also with Iran and North Korea. I'm going to talk a little bit more about NATO expansion in a second. The Russians view NATO expansion from a purely realpolitik point of view. Right? This is balanced power politics. The idea that the United States can take a military alliance that was a mortal enemy of the Soviet Union and march it up to Russia's doorstep and make Ukraine and Georgia part of the West is not going to happen. They'll tell you that. It is not going to happen for balance of power reasons. And all you have to do is talk about the Chinese, about the presence of the American military in East Asia. It bothers them greatly. They do not like the idea of us being on their doorstep. And they'll tell you behind closed doors they intend to push us eventually out beyond the first island chain and then out beyond the second island chain. And I don't blame them one bit, but I'm just telling you, if you're interested in selling liberal hegemony to major powers in the system like Russia and China, you ought to understand that there are real limits to what you can do. And then, of course, you have minor powers like Iran and North Korea. Look at what North Korea is doing today. People say, oh, what North Korea is doing today is crazy. They're irrational. Kim Jong-un, we've never seen anybody this crazy. The thought of him having nuclear weapons is horrifying. I'd make a case that what Kim Jong-un is doing is very reasonable. If I were Kim Jong-un, I'd have nuclear weapons, and I'd never, ever get rid of them. Never. Why? Because the United States is running around the world knocking off regimes. That's what liberal hegemony is all about. That means if you're not a liberal hegemonic state, Think about what Michael Doyle said. You could be in the crosshairs. And how do you prevent regime change? The best way to do it is have nuclear weapons. We don't like that for understandable reasons. But from their point of view, it makes eminently good sense. Iran, I've said in public on a number of occasions, if I was the Iranian National Security Advisor, they'd already have nuclear weapons. And I can guarantee you that if they had nuclear weapons, the Americans and the Israelis would not be threatening them. Very simple. But the point that I'm trying to make to you here is that some states resist. Not all of them, but some. Some are foolish, like Colonel Gaddafi. We promised Colonel Gaddafi that if he gave up his WMD programs, we'd leave him alone. You know where he is now. He's six feet under. Right? Six feet under. Very foolish. <laughs> bottom line here, <laughs> bottom line here is if you can balance, balance. And some figure that out. So anyway, my basic argument is that liberal hegemony is doomed because social engineering is wickedly difficult. Nationalism causes significant resistance. Individuals right, individual rights matter, but not that much. And it should be number four. Realism remains a key factor for some states. Some states. Talk a little bit about the Ukraine crisis. Uh, as I said to you before, NATO expansion, EU expansion, and spreading democracy were all about, uh, all, all about enlarging the security community that existed in Western Europe. And, and there was even thoughts of eventually bringing the Russians in. It was not balance of power politics. But what happened is that after the April 2008 NATO summit in Bucharest, where we said that 
Georgia and Ukraine would become part of NATO. You had shortly thereafter, in August 2008, a war over Georgia, and then in 2014, you had the war over Ukraine. Remember, 2008, April 2008, look at the communique that was issued after the Bucharest NATO summit. It said that Georgia and Ukraine will become part of NATO, and you had wars involving both of those countries. And the Russians have no intention of letting either Georgia or Ukraine become part of the West. They'll wreck both those countries before they let it happen. This is basic geopolitics. And what's happened to Putin? Putin's standing has gone up significantly. Why? Basic nationalism. Nationalism at home. Factors driving the Russian behavior. Realism 101, nationalism, and stability over rights. That's the Russian story. That's why it's so hard to sell liberal democracy in Russia, the last consideration, and why the Ukraine crisis happened, first point. And second point about nationalism is why Putin is so popular. Talk a little bit about the Bush doctrine. There are five countries that were the main targets of regime change. We actually used military force in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya. In the case of Syria, we provided huge amounts of money and training to the rebels. We were deeply committed to overthrowing the government in Damascus, the Assad government. If you read the newspapers in the United States, what you see is people constantly beating Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton over the head for not doing anything to get rid of the regime in Damascus. This is simply wrong. We did not intervene with our own military forces in any meaningful way, but we were behind. We were behind the insurgency in a major way. We were deeply committed to regime change in Syria. And we were also involved in regime change in Egypt. We helped get rid of Mubarak, and then when the Muslim Brotherhood won a democratic election, we helped usher that leader, Mohamed Morsi, out of power when the Egyptian people and the United States became disenchanted with Morsi. But if you just sort of look at those five cases, Afghanistan is a disaster zone, Iraq, another disaster zone, Libya, another disaster zone, Syria, another disaster zone. And although we had a brief interregnum where we had liberal democracy or democracy in Egypt, that lasted about a year. And now we're back to where we have a thug in power who we're comfortable supporting. Right? This is an abysmal track record. Think of all the death and destruction in the Middle East since 2001. It's really stunning, really stunning. This is all, in my opinion, this is all due to local factors plus, in a really big way, liberal hegemony. The United States has played a key role in almost all of those cases. Egypt is the only possible exception in causing a huge amount of murder and mayhem. Right? Local factors mattered, I don't deny that. But the United States played an enormously important role. Bush Doctrine, why did it fail? Difficulty of doing social engineering. Social engineering in Iraq, social engineering in Afghanistan, good luck. So I think I said in the Q&A period last time, when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in 1979, virtually all of my colleagues in the national security community were aghast. They said, oh my God, the Soviets are on the march. This is terrible. Right? We've been weak in the 1970s, dot, dot, dot. My view was exactly the opposite. So the Soviets invading Afghanistan was the best news the United States could have had. They just jumped into a giant quagmire. It's like us going into Vietnam. When I used to go to China in the early 2000s, I used to tell the Chinese, what you really want to do is tell the Americans that they have to win the war on terror. You're counting on them to win the war on terror, and they have to stay in Afghanistan and Iraq till they win the war on terror. Right? That'll be forever. Right? And meanwhile, you sit on the sidelines and just continue to get richer and richer. 
The last thing you want to do if you're China is end up in Vietnam or Afghanistan or Iraq. These are places you want to stay out of for the reasons I said. Difficulty of doing social engineering, nationalism, and the fact that most people, certainly at this point in time, privilege stability over rights. Bottom line, liberal hegemony leads to one failure after another. And this is one of the reasons, ladies and gentlemen, that Donald Trump is president of the United States. He explicitly challenged almost every aspect of liberal hegemony during the 2016 campaign. Almost every aspect. How it all turns out with him, I don't know. But there's a great deal of disenchantment in the body populace in this country. The elites, as I told you, they love liberal hegemony. But the body politic, not so clear. A lot of disenchantment. And I believe that this contributed. I don't think it was the main reason by any means. But I think this contributed to the election of Donald Trump. Let me conclude with one final point, which I think is of great significance. I think that liberal hegemony undermines liberalism at home. It threatens core American values because America becomes a militarized state. You get this huge national security state. And especially when you're fighting a global war on terror and you think you definitely have to monitor what people in the society are doing. You have to turn the National Security Agency loose to monitors people's, monitor people's emails and telephone conversations and so forth and so on. Right? Uh, so I think that uh, as founding fathers understood, James Madison in particular, no nation can preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. And we live in a country that's engaged in continual warfare. And it's engaged in continual warfare because we have decided to pursue a policy of liberal hegemony. And that was not necessary. As Nuno said, when you're in unipolarity, you have three choices, three very different choices, three stark choices. And we decided to do massive social engineering at the end of a rifle barrel. We tried to create a planet that's filled with liberal democracies. And it failed. And that's where we are today. Thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, sir. Please tell me, Professor, how you overcame the temptation to become a member of the State Department. <laughs> His question was, how did I overcome the temptation to become a member of the State Department? Right. It was very simple. It's the way I'm constitutionally wired. I hate authority. <laughs> It's why I love being an academic. As some of you have heard me say, I went to West Point as an undergraduate, and I really hated it. Uh, I'm very thankful I went there because I learned all sorts of important lessons. But I always tell people that I actually hated going to West Point, and I hated the military because I hate guns, I hate sleeping in the woods, I hate shaving, uh, I hate uniforms, but most importantly, I hate authority. Uh, so academia was the ideal place for me. And there was no hope that I could function in a meaningful way in the State Department, because I'd have to take orders from somebody. Sir. Could you say a word about the role of religion in this uh, dynamic, both the, from the Muslim countries that we're interacting with, but also uh, from the Christian United States? <coughs> yeah, his, his question is, could I say something about the role of religion? I downplay religion in my story, obviously, which is what uh, prompted your question. If I were to talk about religion, I would embed it in the discussion of nationalism. Okay? And my argument is that when you begin to sort of unpack the concept of nationalism and get it its essence, you have to talk about culture. right? All, all of these nations have particular cultures, and cultures are all about different practices and beliefs, okay? So one set of beliefs that you can have involve religion. 
Sam Huntington has written a book called Who Are We? that argues that the United States at its root is a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant country. And that has not changed in any fundamental way. And he's talking about nationalism and he's taking that argument about Protestantism and he is integrating it into nationalism, right? If you were to look at a country like Iran, it's obvious that when you talk about Iranian nationalism, you have to incorporate religion into it, okay? Now I think where the real conflict comes up, the intellectual conflict comes up on this issue, is that there are a lot of people who believe that religion uh, transcends boundaries and matters in very important ways. So to go to another book that Sam Huntington wrote, which is The Clash of Civilizations, right? When he talked about Islam versus Christianity, right? This Western civilization that where Christianity really matters in this Islamic civilization. Religion is of great importance, right? And the fault lines in his story in that book involve religion. I don't think that theory of his explains how the world works hardly at all. Because I view the world as based on a system of nation states. I made this point to you folks in the previous lecture. If you look at the planet, looks differently. You look at Western Europe, or you look at Europe in 1450, right? Look at a map of Europe in 1450. There are douches, principalities, empires, city-states, a wide assortment of different kinds of political orders. There are no states. Today, if you look at the entire planet, it's populated by nothing but nation-states. Nothing but nation states. Nationalism is an incredibly powerful force. So I subordinate religion to nationalism, right? And when I hear, you know, uh, about how in the Middle East we have this Islamic force that's arrayed against us, you know, I say, we went in to rescue Kuwait, which was an Islamic country that was invaded by Iraq, which is an Islamic country. Between 1980 and 1988, Iran and Iraq fought this incredibly bloody war. Saudi Arabia and Iran today are both Islamic countries. Now you could say it's Shia versus Sunni. Final point to you is you should look at the literature on the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648. There's a book out from Harvard University Press by Peter Wilson. Very interesting book. And the question you should ask yourself when you read the book is how much of the Thirty Years' War, which is you know, in the aftermath of the Reformation and where you would expect religion to really matter big time. How much of the conflict is driven by religion and how much of it is driven by basic balance of power politics? It's actually surprising how little religion mattered, in my opinion. I don't want to be so foolish as to say religion didn't matter at all. And in fact, this is a case where if religion was going to matter, this is the place you would expect it to matter, right? But in fact, religion oftentimes in the story gets subordinated to just good old fashioned balance of power politics. So all this is to say, I kind of downplay the importance of religion. Sir. Professor, we talked about how Russian invasion of Georgia and Ukraine was a response to a possible NATO uh, expansion. Uh, but uh, Russia has been at it for quite a long time, way before Russia, quick for NATO expansion was possible, like early 90s. Also, there is uh, some, uh, there's some uh, evidence that the uh, 2008 invasion was uh, being prepared way before Bucharest summit. Also, there was a Chechnyan issue way before that. Uh, so, would you say that those invasions and also trial to destabilize uh, the region were exclusively Russian uh, uh, response to possible NATO enlargement? Or do you also think they're trying to <coughs> their, uh, uh, okay, l let me repeat your question for everybody, and you correct me or fill in the blanks if I don't exactly re uh, represent your question. He he's basically challenging me uh, on the point that uh, NATO expansion caused the Russian reaction over Georgia and over Ukraine. And he's saying that there's evidence before 2008, which is the key 
point that we both agree on. Before 2008, there was evidence of Russian aggression. He said, for example, uh, there's the case of Chechnya, right? And he said uh, there's evidence that uh, the Russians had plans to invade Crimea and Ukraine uh, before the 2008 crisis. And Georgia. And Georgia before the 2008 crisis, okay? Uh, I disagree with you, and, and here's why. First of all, Chechnya is inside Russia. It's not outside. So uh, that's not evidence of aggression. Secondly, I've spent an enormous amount of time trying to find evidence that the Russians had contingency plans for taking Crimea before February 22nd, 2014. I can find no evidence. My, my point was that not, they were not planning to take Crimea in 2008. My, my point is that they were trying, they had plans, uh, they had made plans to invade Georgia way before the first summit in April. And also as for Chechnya, Chechnya was an independent country before it was Sovietized uh, in 1991, I believe. Yes, but we're talking about after 1990. And Georgia was also I, I just, I think there's no evidence uh, of Russian aggression. And, and just, if you look at the deployment of Russian forces in the western districts of Russia, there are hardly any military forces there in February of 2014. And in fact, if you look at the Russian case, and, and, and by the way, if you go to Russia today, you'll find the same thing. The Russians do not want an arms race with the West. They do not want an arms race with the United States. And they don't want an arms race with the United States because they understand that what got the Soviet Union into trouble was that the Soviet Union spent much too much money on defense and not enough money on refurbishing the economy. And this is a country that is in economic trouble. It's a giant gas station. They understand that they have to modernize the, arm, uh, modernize the economy, and that involves spending lots of money. And you can't do that if you're fighting wars with the West. Furthermore, I believe the Russians, especially Putin, are very sophisticated uh, strategists. And they understand full well that the last thing they want to do is invade a country in Eastern Europe and occupy it, right? It would be the height of foolishness, right? I often say to people, if you really want to wreck Russia, what you ought to do is encourage them to invade a couple countries in Eastern Europe. Let's see how that works out. Not very well, or if you don't like that, you can have them invade Afghanistan again. They can go in and take over for us, right? I think the Russians understand this, that, that expansion, this is, this is the power of nationalism. You know, I've made the argument on a number of occasions, the two principal blocks against military aggression today are number one, nuclear weapons, and number two, nationalism. Nationalism makes it very hard to conquer countries, especially if you have to occupy them. And I think the Russians fully understand this. I'll just say one final point on this. Russia is a declining great power, largely for demographic reasons, but also for economic reasons. Just look at the, demographic, the projected demographic curves out to 2050. Big trouble, big trouble on the horizon. Uh, sir. Um, yeah. First of all, thanks for the comments so far. While I agree with most of what you've said, I, I'd like to challenge you on three points. Three? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said you agreed with most of what I said. So uh, I think we have like different understandings of liberal hegemony. I think what you are basically saying is that it's all about military interventions in foreign countries. But I would rather say it's more about values and norms and a liberal order that is set up after the Second World War where legitimacy is, plays a big role. So you have Western Europe, for example, that didn't have to be invaded, France, Great Britain, Spain, in order to comply to, to the liberal order of the US and you did you did a pretty good job in, in, in Western Germany when it comes to social engineering and also in South Korea. So I would I would challenge your understanding of liberal hegemony. I, I think it's 
it more, it's more suitable to talk about imperialism when we talk about interventions. Uh, and secondly, you, you said that net nationalism is, is a great resistance to the liberal hegemony because it's all about self-determination and sovereignty. But we've seen that national states, such as Russia, themselves do not uh, care a lot about self-determination and sovereignty of other countries. So for example, we could see NATO, NATO expansion eastwards, we could see it as an expansion, but we also can look at it that it is sovereign decisions yeah. by the states as Poland, as a Czech Republic, and so on, who had a past with Soviet uh, aggression to decide on their own. To okay, you, got, you have to be shorter. I, yeah, to become member. I'll take your second yeah. point, just quickly. Yeah. My argument which I did not expound on just because of time, is that states care greatly about their own sovereignty, but great powers especially violate the sovereignty of other countries all the time. That's okay. not a characteristic of liberal hegemony. Pardon? It's not, uh, it's not the old, it's not a... Only, it's not only liberal hegemony that behaves that way. That, that may be true, but nevertheless, if you're going to pursue a policy of liberal hegemony, you want to understand that when you invade other countries, you're going to bump up against nationalism. That was my point. But you're absolutely right. I mean, we went into Vietnam, a remarkably foolish decision, right, because we believed in the domino theory, which is a sort of a misguided realist view of the world. Uh, we didn't go in there for purposes of promoting liberal democracy, but still it happened there. What was your first point again? Um, about values. A narrow understanding of liberal hegemony, just, yeah, just I, basically uh, about interventions and not about like putting up international institutions okay. that pursue a liberal order. Well, I, I think the most powerful point you made that's the most difficult for me to deal with is, is your point that we actually uh, made liberal democracy work in West Germany during the Cold War. And again, as I said in the talk, we created this zone of liberal democracies in Western Europe. Uh, and then your other point was South Korea. We're eventually in South Korea. It took quite a while. Uh, we got a liberal democracy. I just make a couple points just to stick to Western Europe. First of all, we were an occupier in Western Europe, especially in Germany. But we were an occupier in large part because there was this thing there called the Soviet threat that the West Europeans feared greatly, the Americans feared greatly, and the West Europeans wanted us there to protect them. That's point number one. Point number two is, just to take Germany, Germany actually had a rich history of democracy, right? Weimar Germany was a liberal democracy. And there is a whole literature that argues that Germany was a democracy, a liberal democracy, before World War I. Now that's a disputed claim, but there are people who make that argument. So it was not that difficult, given that Germany had been destroyed, number one, given the fact that Germany needed us to protect them against the Soviet Union, or at least they thought they did, and number three, that they had a history of democracy for us to make it work there. Right? So there are circumstances where it can be made to work. Very unusual circumstances. But what happens in the cases that we're talking about is you get the United States invading countries that have hardly any history of democracy, don't face external threats except from us, right? and uh, it therefore becomes very difficult. Yes? Um, yeah, uh, in countries that are lacking in the, the history of uh, liberal democratic history and where there's a really high level of internecine violence, uh, Iraq, Syria, maybe to a lesser extent Burma these days, what would your theory say about whether it would be better or worse for those countries to maintain their territorial integrity or to split apart? Um, uh, yeah. I, I don't have anything to say about that in, in my theories, so to speak. Um, I mean, I have views on those subjects. Uh, but there's no kind of uh, overarching theoretical thought about whether that violence is better contained within a nation state or kind of between nation states. No, I mean, not, not as part of the argument that I'm making up here. 
I mean, I, I had all sorts of views and wrote about this in the 1990s with regard to Yugoslavia, but we'd really get off the trail if I started talking about that. And I'm not sure I could remember everything I said at the time. <laughs> Sir. Uh, yes, uh, I, I really appreciated what you said about Germany. Uh, how would you, though, m make, ha ha is it possible to make the same argument with respect to Japan after World War II or or, I mean, similarly, were, was the United States then looking at the China threat, or how, how, how do you, uh, how, how do you uh, think about that? Well, uh, the Japanese case is similar to the German case. First of all, Japan was destroyed, much the way Germany was destroyed. One cannot underestimate the extent to which these two countries were destroyed. Uh, you know, in the Japanese case, we we're firebombing Japanese cities starting on March 10th, 1945. And uh, we killed more people the first night we firebombed Tokyo than were killed at either Hiroshima or Nagasaki. We were burning Japanese cities to the ground uh, at an incredibly rapid pace. Uh, and, uh, and then we dropped two nuclear weapons on them. And uh, there were very few Japanese cities left that, uh, uh, that weren't wrecked. And, uh, uh, and they had suffered a devastating defeat in the war. Lots of Japanese had died. Uh, so this was a wrecked country. And they did believe they, too, faced the Soviet threat. And you want to remember that in those days, people believed when North Korea invaded South Korea on June 25th, 1950, that North Korea was a Soviet proxy, and people believed in the domino theory, foolish as it was, and the Japanese therefore were very nervous. And of course they were very nervous about the Chinese as well, because the Chinese and the North Koreans and the Soviets and the North Vietnamese were all seen as part of a seamless web. These were people who did not appreciate the importance of nationalism, okay? And uh, so they had that. But also Japan did have a period where it was a liberal democracy. Uh, and uh, that was mainly in the 1920s. Uh, I don't think it was as progressive as Germany was, Weimar Germany, but nevertheless, I think the basic ingredients were there. The other case that's raised, by the way, uh, uh, against me sometimes, are, are the uh, Eastern European revolutions in 1989, right? Because there, you got democracy. And the, arg I mean, the argument that people like me make is that that was from the bottom up. What happened in 1989 was not a case of the United States causing regime change and helping to create a liberal democracy. It was the collapse of the Soviet Union and the evacuation of Soviet forces, and in a very important way, the return of sovereignty to those countries where there were powerful democratic or liberal democratic forces down below that bubbled up. Uh, because I remember in the context of the Iraq war, uh, opponents of that war, like myself, argued that things would go south, as I believe they did. And many of the proponents of the war, this is the Iraq war in 2003, would argue that the experience of the various countries in Eastern Europe showed that once you got rid of a dictator, Right? Once you got rid of an authoritarian leader, that democracy would bubble up from the bottom. And of course, that did happen in Eastern Europe, but we didn't do it. And, uh, and, and the situation in the Middle East was fundamentally different. Yes, ma'am. starting to vocalize a preference for democracy where they don't have that. Are those places only right for democracy if there is enough of a critical mass and therefore whether it's the United States or any other country ought to leave them be until there is a popular revolution like that? Where do people's preferences for democracy fit into your theory? And then to go back to a point you made. Could I answer your first question first just because I'll forget it? <laughs> but I'll answer your second question too. Yeah, and, and the second, it actually wasn't a question. It was a challenge to something. Was it the first? 
<laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. You can ask both of them. In your slide about Donald Trump's election, you gave a lot of credence to this idea of American spreading of left hegemony being the explanation for why he had such popular support. But that seems to ignore a lot of what was happening domestically. So either Donald Trump is the junior genius and he was able to figure all of this out and then get elected based on that, or there's more in terms of what was happening at home and again, people's preferences for the future of their country. So I'd be curious to hear thoughts on both of those. Questions. Just on the second part, I think what was going on at home was more important than foreign policy. I, I didn't mean to oversell foreign policy. I thought I used qualifying language. I was not arguing that um, the principal reason he got elected was that he opposed liberal hegemony. Uh, I, I just said it contributed. Uh, I, I think your description is on the money, that it was mainly domestic politics. Uh, the fact that there's a large amount of resentment in this country involving jobs and income and so forth and so on. Those kinds of things, I think, really mattered more. But I was just saying this contributed to it. Uh, and your first question is, where do people fit in? And I, I think you said, where do people's preferences fit in, especially preferences for democracy? Uh, well, first of all, I think people are a big part of my story when it comes to nationalism, right, uh, for sure. And. Uh, uh, I understand your point about preferences, and I think if, uh, if people in a particular country want to become democratic, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, as I said in the first lecture, uh, my views on liberal democracy at home are fundamentally different than my views on liberal democracy abroad. I thank my lucky stars. I was born in the United States, which is a liberal democracy, and I think all things considered, I prefer to live in a liberal democracy than any other form of political system, any other kind of political system. But my argument is when you take it abroad, it leads to all sorts of problems. I tend to favor self-determination. And I believe that if people want to become democratic, that's up to them, right? And it's not our business to go in and influence things one way or the other. And I think you end up getting into lots of trouble. Now, some people might say, you might say, that, John, you can do this in a sophisticated way. The problem is that we've behaved in blunderpuss fashion in the past. Let's do it in a sophisticated way. Let's pay attention to the preferences of people in other countries and so forth and so on. I kind of understand that argument, but I think you then run into what I call the slippery slope problem, that once you get in the business of trying to promote democracy in other countries, and you're as powerful as the United States, and you're as confident as people in the United States are about your ability to do social engineering, you're off to the races. And I don't like that at all. So for purposes of promoting democracy, my way of doing it would be to be the city on the hill. And to tie that into my last point, the argument I was making is that it's hard to be the city on the hill when you're intervening all over the planet in a militarized fashion because you're undermining liberalism at home. And I am, I'm actually a huge civil libertarian. I'm, uh, and I think civil liberties matter enormously. And uh, I think the idea of having a national security state is frightening. You go to Washington these days, it is a national security state. We're addicted to war. And again, I'm not against having a military. I went to West Point. I was in the military for 10 years of my life. I understand you need a military. But I think you have to be very, very careful uh, not to uh, turn the United States into a militaristic state. And I think when you pursue your more sophisticated defense of liberal hegemony or promoting liberal democracy around the world, you quickly run into the slippery slope problem. That would sort of be my argument. I think we have time for one more question. Sir. Uh, accepting for a moment that the Russian resentment was justified and the Russian reactions was uh, purely defensive in, in, in the past years. I mean, your theory kind of leads us at the point that at the reactionary kind of uh, perception of the global affairs, like, should we go back to the sphere of influences and not uh, mingle with other countries? 
Did, did everybody hear his question? Uh, his view is basically that I have a more or less reactionary view and that what I'm talking about in, in, in defending the Russians is basically arguing that we should go back to uh, a sphere of influences view of the world. And I interpret, and I don't think you would have any trouble with this, I, I interpret a sphere of influences type of the world to be basic balance of power politics, right? They, they go together, right? Uh, now, I believe that you can't go back to balance of power politics because we never left them behind, right? <laughs> this is what... This is what we forgot when we moved NATO eastward. Balance of power politics was alive and well. Not in the United States, but in Russia. And it's true in China. And it's true in Iran. And it's true in South Korea. Right? So the idea that this is old think, I mean, I think this is the way most Americans think. Your view is what I would call the today, the sort of typical American view of international politics. We have transcended spheres of influence. Right? We live in a different world. And I, I don't believe that for one second. I believe balance of power politics is alive and well. And this is why we got ourselves in so much trouble on Russia. Now, I just want to unpack this a bit more. Talk about the rise of China, okay? If China continues to rise and Russia continues to come back from the dead, we move from unipolarity to multipolarity, or if you want to excise the Russians and just talk about the Chinese and the Americans, you move back to bipolarity. Okay? Now remember what I said in the presentation. If you're in a bipolar world or you're in a multipolar world, you cannot pursue liberal hegemony. Right. So my argument is that if China continues to rise, the United States will engage in an intense security competition with China where balance of power politics and spheres of influence matter greatly. And if you go to China today and you talk to the Chinese about the South China Sea and the East China Sea, and you talk about the American military presence in those areas, they do not like it because they view those areas as their sphere of influence. They understand that we got in there when China was weak, but they'd like to get us out. And I would argue that what you'll see with the United States is that the United States will think in terms of spheres of influence. You know what the Monroe Doctrine is, right? The Monroe Doctrine basically says that the United States owns the Western Hemisphere. And no distant great power, be it from Europe or be it from Asia, is allowed to move military forces into the Western Hemisphere and form a military alliance with a country in our hemisphere. The Monroe Doctrine, which has not gone away, right? the Monroe Doctrine is all about spheres of influence. It says the Western Hemisphere is our sphere of influence. Do you think in 25 years, if China decides to form a military alliance with Canada or Mexico and station a couple Chinese divisions in Vancouver and Toronto, that we're not going to go ballistic? <laughs> You're a young guy, so you probably don't remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. Unfortunately, I'm not a young guy, and I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. The idea that the Soviets were putting missiles in Cuba was completely antithetical to us. And then when they talked about building a naval base at Cienfuegos, we almost blew another gasket. The Soviets are not allowed in the Western Hemisphere. Why? Because it's an American sphere of influence. Why? Because it's our backyard. Well, if you're Vladimir Putin or any Russian leader, the idea that NATO is going to be allowed to drive right up to your border, it's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And you know, people will say, well, John, don't you understand that the Ukrainians are free to choose their own foreign policy? You often hear this argument. We were talking about this yesterday. 
the Ukrainians are free to choose their own foreign policy. They're a sovereign state. This is not a decision the Russians can make for them. My view is that's a very dangerous way of thinking about international politics. Ukraine is not a sovereign state when it comes to this issue. The Russians are not going to tolerate them forming an alliance with NATO. Right? And if Ukraine behaves like it is a sovereign state, right, it's going to get itself into a well of a lot of trouble. This is what happened to Castro. Do you think the United States believed during the Cold War, and even after the Cold War, that Cuba had the right as a sovereign state to form an alliance with any state that it chose to? We didn't think that for one second. We did not think that for one second. And we went to great lengths to kill Castro and to strangle Cuba because Castro thought that he, like the Ukrainians thought, had the right to form an alliance with just any state. When you're dealing with great powers, and this is another lecture, great powers are ruthless. The United States is one of the most ruthless great powers in modern history. You cannot underestimate how ruthless the United States is. This is all covered up in the textbooks and the classes uh, that we take growing up, right? Because we, this is all part of nationalism. Nationalism is all about creating myths about how wonderful your country is, right? It's America, right or wrong. We never do anything wrong, right? If you really look carefully at how the United States has operated over time, it's really amazing how ruthless we have been. And the British, the same is true of them as well. Uh, but we cover it up. So I'm just saying, if you're, if you're Ukraine and you're living next to a powerful state like Russia, or you're Cuba and you're living next to a very powerful state like the United States, you should be very, very careful. Because this is like sleeping in bed with an elephant. If that elephant rolls over on top of you, you're dead, right? So you've got to be very careful. Am I happy about the fact that this is the way the world works? No, I'm not. But it is the way the world works, for better or for worse. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to the third and final lecture in this series of Stimson Lectures uh, by John Mearsheimer, Liberal Dreams and International Realities. That's the name of the forthcoming book, is it? I'm not sure that not that sure. will finally be the okay. title. But the something. working title of the forthcoming book from Yale University Press in the Stimson Lecture series. And today he is going to be speaking about the case for restraint. Welcome, John. Thank you, Ian. Uh, as I said yesterday and on Monday, it is a great pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, and I feel actually somewhat sad that this is my last lecture. Because uh, as you know, I like talking and uh, this is a fascinating subject. And I could give at least five more lectures on it. Uh, the first night, uh, I talked about the roots of liberal hegemony, and that talk, as those of you who were there know, was really mainly about liberalism, did not say much about international politics. And then uh, last night, I talked about the false promise of liberal hegemony, and liberal hegemony, of course, is all about international politics. And I made the case that uh, since the Cold War ended, the United States has pursued a policy of liberal hegemony, and it's led to nothing but trouble, uh, and it's been very costly as well. Uh, and what I want to do tonight is make the case for restraint, and this is an argument that what we need is a more restrained foreign policy. And the way I'd like to proceed is I'd like to ask the I'd like to start by asking the question: Does liberalism encourage restraint? And I'd actually like to go back to sort of Monday night's lecture and just talk a little bit about the nature of liberalism and make the argument that inside of liberalism there is 
an important strand that would push a great power to pursue a policy of restraint, not a policy of liberal hegemony. And then answer the question of why that strand of liberalism seems to lose out to the more expansive strand. Then I want to talk about restraint, what exactly it is. Talk about realism in restraint, because I'll make the argument that restraint is basically a realist foreign policy. Then I want to talk about nationalism in restraint. And uh, as you remember from that first talk, I said that what I was really interested in doing in this book was talking about the relationship between liberalism, nationalism, and realism. So here you see the realism and nationalism coming into play uh, to challenge the liberalism. And then I want to talk about where the United States is headed today. That's, what I'll, that's where I will end. So the first question is, does liberalism itself encourage restraint? And there are actually two strands in liberalism. There's a universalist strand and a particularist strand. And what I have done in the past two lectures is hammered away at the universalist strand. This is a slide <coughs> excuse me, that I used the other night. Uh, and that those of you who have been to either one of the previous lectures is very familiar with. And my argument is that when you focus on the individual uh, and you marry inalienable rights to that individual, you get a universalist ideology, right? Because every person on the planet has this set of inalienable rights. And you're focusing on individuals, not countries or nations. You're focusing on individuals, and they all have these rights. So you see that powerful universalist tendency. And I've made the argument, of course, that what that does is inexorably lead to a foreign policy where you try to spread liberal democracy all over God's little green acre. But inside liberalism, there's also a particularist strand. Liberalism's particularist strand is based on the fact that it's impossible to agree on first principles. Remember, I stress that at great length in the first lecture. Liberalism is based on the assumption that individuals cannot reach agreement on universal truth. There are always going to be disputes. So it's impossible to agree on first principles, and therefore it's imperative to adopt a live and let live political order. This is why liberalism privileges liberty and tolerance. This is what I love about living in liberal America. Right? There's a great emphasis placed on giving people a lot of space to lead their lives the way they want to. And we emphasize things like tolerance and peaceful conflict resolution. These are wonderful values. Uh, so you know, it's kind of modus vivendi liberalism. And then I say, shouldn't this basic logic apply to relations among states? just as it applies to relations among individuals. Shouldn't we, as liberal America, tolerate the fact that China has no interest in being a liberal state and prefers to be an authoritarian state? Or if someone wants to create a fascist state, why should we care? According to liberalism, you're not supposed to be able to say that liberalism is better than fascism or authoritarianism or communism. Take your choice. According to liberalism, right, people can't agree on first principles and therefore you want to give people plenty of room to live their life the way they see fit. Well, why doesn't the same argument apply to states? Why aren't we more tolerant? Again, if you go back to the universalist strand, there's no tolerance there. Remember that Michael Doyle quote I put on the screen yesterday, when Michael Doyle basically says, any non-liberal or illiberal state is at war with its people. Whew, you know, if you believe that, and you're off to the races. Right? But again, there's a particularist strand as well as a universalist strand. But what's clear is 
that the universalist strand wins out. And the question is, why is that the case? And I'm not 100% sure, but it's probably because liberals tend to believe that they have discovered at least one important truth. They're basically violating their core precept that you can't reach agreement on first principles. Liberals are basically saying that liberal democracy is the best political order and there is no acceptable alternative. But you're not supposed to be able to say that. But that's certainly the way they act. So all of this is to say, I think if you look carefully at liberalism, one could argue that really it should lead to a policy of restraint, a modus vivendi type foreign policy. But of course it doesn't. Okay. Restraint. What's restraint? I'm putting forward the argument that the United States should adopt a policy of foreign policy of restraint. First of all, it's a realist foreign policy. And one of the really difficult tasks that I face in giving this presentation and writing this book is that most Americans hate realism and they love liberalism. And anyone like me who comes along and says we should adopt a realist foreign policy and abandon a liberal foreign policy really has a tough sell in front of him or her. Okay, but restraint is a realist foreign policy and I'll explain why that's a good thing. Uh, whether you agree with me is another matter. Uh, restraint also pays significant attention to the power of nationalism, a theme that I've beaten hard in the previous two lectures. Policy of restraint basically calls for getting out of the business of spreading democracy or promoting democracy around the globe, uh, and especially at the end of a rifle barrel. My view is if you want to spread democracy around the world, the best way to do it is to be the city on the hill, right? Have a model democracy at home, and then you can expound to other people what you think the virtues are of liberal democracy, and then leave it up to them to decide what to do. But you don't want to purposely try to spread it with aggressive policies. That's what restraint is basically all about. Okay, realism and restraint. The essence of realism. Realism focuses on great powers, not minor powers. For realists, the states that really matter are the great powers in the system. And the only time that minor powers really matter is when those minor powers are adjacent to great powers. <coughs> Korea and Poland are two good examples, right? Poland matters because it's sandwiched in between Russia and Germany or the Soviet Union and Germany or way back when Austria, Hungary, Germany and Russia. Poland matters. Korea matters because Korea is sandwiched in between Japan, China, and Russia. The three countries that have the worst geographical location in the world are Korea and Poland. And now I think you could probably throw in Ukraine, right? These are countries that really are in the wrong location, right? And they're minor powers, they matter. But by and large, by and large, realism is a theory that focuses on the great powers, and it focuses on the balance of power, right? The argument that realists make is that those great powers care greatly about how much power they have relative to the other great powers in the system. Um, realists, as you know, pay little attention to domestic politics. Realists basically treat states as black boxes. Uh, it doesn't matter to most realists whether a state is a uh, democracy or an authoritarian state. The structure of the international system in the realist story basically forces most states to behave in similar ways. Right? And you can see where Americans would hate a theory like that because Americans believe that the world is populated by good guys and bad guys, and we're the good guys, and other states that look like us are also good guys, but everybody else is a bad guy. 
that's kind of consistent with liberal hegemony, right? And that's why we want to make all of the states in the world liberal democracies, because they then all look like us. And if we're the good guys and everybody looks like us, that means you have a planet that's populated by good guys. And in a planet that's populated by good guys, you can't have anything but happy outcomes. Right? That's the liberal story. The realist story is it just doesn't matter. Right? And the realist story is that the big enchiladas in the system are going to compete with each other. And this occasionally going to fight wars with each other. Now, very important to understand that there's a distinction between defensive realists and offensive realists. And I want to talk about the defensive realists. The defensive realists are a very interesting lot. Their basic message is that the structure of the international system encourages states not to go to war with each other. States, they say, should concentrate on defending the balance of power not trying to change the balance of power. It's a really quite interesting argument. And the key reason for this is balancing behavior. If the three of us are great powers, and I start to accumulate more power, these two other states are going to get very nervous. They're going to form a military alliance, and they're going to try and contain us. The defensive realists would say, look at what happened to Napoleonic France. They got greedy and they got crushed by a balancing coalition of five European states. Look at what happened to Imperial Germany. Look at what happened to Nazi Germany. Look at what happened to Imperial Japan. They got aggressive, balancing coalitions formed, and they were crushed. The Germans should have just sat still. The Japanese should have just sat still. They were in the catbird seat. No need, no need to be aggressive. And when you are aggressive, you get crushed. So you have defensive realists like my good friend Charlie Glazer, who wrote a famous article called Realists as Optimists. Right? So you can see why these guys like restraint. Right? Because realism leads to no war. Here's Mark Trachtenberg, another good friend of mine, historian, first class historian. These are some quotes from an article that he wrote. Realism is at heart a theory of peace. Right? Power is not unstable. It's impractical idealism, that's liberal hegemony, that leads to endless conflict. Serious trouble developed only when states failed to act in a way that made sense in power political terms. Right. So the case from restraint from a defensive realist point of view right, uh, really leads to a remarkably peaceful world. Now, as many of you know, there are offensive realists out there in the world like me, who think the defensive realists are wrong. I believe that the structure of the system is not benign. It encourages states to compete with each other for power. Right? States constantly want to improve their position in the balance of power. And for me, the ultimate goal is to be the hegemon in the system. And sometimes states will go to war to achieve that end. I do not believe like Mark Trachtenberg or Charlie Glazer or Ken Waltz or Steve Van Ever or Jack Snyder, all of these defensive realists, that structure is benign. I have a much more Hobbesian view of the world. Uh, still, even offensive realists like me, right? would argue that if you follow the precepts of my theory, you'll have a less warlike world than you will following the precepts of liberal hegemony. And why is that the case? Three reasons. Here's the first. First, realists are only willing to fight in limited areas of the world. Liberal hegemonists want to fight everywhere because they're interested 
in spreading liberal democracy all over the planet. There is no area of the world that is unimportant from a strategic point of view for a liberal hegemonist. They don't prioritize. There are no priorities. For a realist, that's not true at all. During the Cold War, the United States was interested in competing with the Soviets all over the planet. Realists said this is ridiculous. There are only three areas of the world that matter for the United States. Europe, in those days we used to say Northeast Asia, and the Persian Gulf. Those are the three areas you fight and die. The rest of the Middle East, no. Africa, no. Central Asia, no. Southeast Asia, no. It's no accident that every realist except Henry Kissinger was opposed to the Vietnam War. It's a strategically unimportant area. You only fight in areas where there are great powers, or in the case of the Gulf, a critical resource, oil. But again, for liberals, a very different story. Reason number two. Realists understand, even offensive realists like me, understand that balancing behavior takes place. I believe that if China continues to grow, in terms of economic and military power, and it begins to assert its influence in the East China Sea, the South China Sea, over Taiwan, and in other places on its periphery, there'll be a very powerful balancing coalition that forms against it. And there'll be limits to what the Chinese can do. This is the defensive realist argument. I think they take it too far. They don't understand that sometimes states don't balance effectively, and there's opportunities to acquire power on a part of the aspiring hegemon. But the point here is all realists understand basic balancing logic. Liberals don't, because liberals believe that realists like me, and even realists like Mark Trachtenberg, are products of the 17th century. We're old think. We're dinosaurs. So they just think you can, this gets back to my discussion of NATO yesterday, they think that you can march NATO right up to Russia's borders and it's not going to matter to the Russians. Realists say this is crazy. You march NATO up to Russia's borders, you're going to have big trouble. No surprise that you had a war over Georgia in August 2008 and that you have a war in Ukraine starting in February 2014. Basic balance of power logic. But liberals don't believe in balance of power logic. And what I'm saying to you here is that if you understand realist logic, it makes you much more cautious. And that gets to my third point. It's not something that's peculiar to realism, but it does tend to be peculiar to realists. Realists are basically Clausewitzians. Realists, for the most part, pay a lot of attention to military affairs. They read Clausewitz. They take him very seriously. They study military history. Uh, liberals don't. And when you read Clausewitz and you study military history, you understand you are in the realm of unintended consequences. Anybody who goes to war thinking this is going to be easy, the way all these boys and girls in the Bush administration, and even outside the Bush administration, thought when we went into Iraq in 2003, these people are living in a dream world. It's just not the way international politics works. You go to war, it's basically a crapshoot. This is the realm of unintended consequences incredibly complicated enterprise war. How it all turns out, hard to predict. Of course, sometimes you go because the potential benefits far outweigh the costs, and you think the likelihood of success is quite high. But, uh, but realists tend to be very cautious. So the point I'm making to you here is you have this group of defensive realists who believe that the structure is remarkably benign. So if you adopt a realist foreign policy, you get no war. Then you have realists like me who don't accept that view, who think that realism does lead to a rather Hobbesian world. But nevertheless, even for realists of my stripe, you'll get a less aggressive foreign policy than you get with liberal hegemony. Because again, with realists, you get priorities, Respect for balancing behavior and respect for the fact that war is an enterprise that is very hard to predict. Realism and the two big fiascos. In my lifetime, I could 
not think of any two greater fiascos than the Vietnam War and the Iraq War. Uh, as I said to you before, every realist opposed the Vietnam War. Uh, the two principal thorns, in my opinion, in LBJ's Heine during the run-up to Vietnam were Hans Borgenthal and Walter Lippmann, both card-carrying realists. George Kennan was opposed to the war. Ken Waltz was an adamant opponent of the war before the war went south in 1968. He was an opponent in 63, 64, 65. And with regard to the Iraq War, virtually every realist, again except for Henry Kissinger, opposed the Iraq War. Thought it was a boneheaded idea to invade Iraq. So the point that I'm trying to make to you is if you adopt a realist foreign policy, it's clearly not an idealist foreign policy. There's no question about that. But you're going to get a lot less murder and mayhem in the system. And you're not going to end up with a militaristic state called the United States of America. You're going to get a restrained foreign policy, which I think is a good thing. Now, if you could convince me that liberal hegemony works, then I'd have real problems arguing with you. Because it works. And even though the costs may be greater, the benefits are really wonderful. But it doesn't work. It leads to disaster. So I say, from a realist perspective, we need a more restrained foreign policy. Bottom line, realism is not a recipe for peace, but it's more peaceful than liberal hegemony. Now, let me turn to nationalism and restraint. Remember, I have a double-barreled shotgun here, realism and nationalism. Key point you want to keep in mind about nationalism it makes conquest very hard. And that has consequences. Two consequences. And I want to lay those consequences out. And then I want to talk about the domino theory in Vietnam, which some of the older dogs in the audience will remember. First of all, because conquest is hard, that means the United States should be very wary about trying to conquer other states. Right? Uh, and second, you want to remember that the ability of your adversary to conquer other states is also greatly limited by nationalism. So what I'm saying here is if you understand nationalism, you understand the power of nationalism, it's going to make you very cautious about going on a rampage or trying to conquer other countries. And it's going to make you less worried when your adversary starts to try to conquer other countries. Remember what I told you about my views on Afghanistan in 1979. When the Soviets went into Afghanistan in 1979, Virtually everybody in the world I operate in was apoplectic. Oh my God, they're on the march, right? They've just conquered Afghanistan, right? It's, where are they going to go next? Probably Iran. Who knows? My view is exactly the opposite. They've just jumped into a giant quagmire. This is wonderful news. Wonderful news. Right? So, so, so the point is, you don't want to jump into Vietnam if you're the United States, and if the Soviet Union decides that they want to jump into Vietnam, by the way, the Chinese, you remember the Chinese? Chinese and the Soviets helped the Vietnamese beat us uh, in Vietnam. We lost in 75. Then in 79, the Chinese invaded North Vietnam, and they got their snouts whacked. Surprise of surprises. First it was the French, then it was us, then it was the Chinese. That's a place you want to stay out of, right? And if you're dealing with an adversary that decides it wants to go into Vietnam, well, be my guest, right? Good luck. So let's talk a little bit about the domino theory. The domino theory goes like this. Uh, it uh, says that communism is, like liberalism, is a universal ideology. And what happens is 
that if the Soviet Union succeeds in Vietnam, then Thailand will fall, Indonesia will fall, Singapore will fall, Japan will fall, Korea will fall, eventually the dominoes will fall in Europe, and eventually the big domino, the United States, will fall. Right? And, and, and again, it's based on the notion that, that one, conquest is easy, and two, when you conquer those other countries, what will happen is that other countries will just bandwagon because, first of all, they'll find communism very attractive. They'll find communism very attractive for ideological reasons. But secondly, they'll understand that they're going to be conquered next. Just to take this out of context, the domino theory and then how it applies to the Bush doctrine. Remember I said yesterday, the Bush doctrine called for knocking off regimes in the Middle East and replacing them with liberal democracies. And the first place on the train line was Iraq. But Iraq was not the last place. We were then going to do Syria, do Iran. When the Israelis caught wind in January 2002, we wrap up the war in Afghanistan, or at least so we think, in December 2001. And then in early 2002, we're getting the shotgun loaded to go into Iraq. The Israelis catch wind of that. They send a high-level delegation to Washington, and they say, are you crazy? Iraq is not the principal threat in the region. Iran is, and the Israelis want us to do Iran. The administration and the neocons on the outside say, relax, we're going to do Iran after we do Iraq, or if we do Syria after we do Iraq, by the time we roll up Iraq and then roll up Syria, the Iranians will throw up their hands and jump on the bandwagon. Right? That's the domino theory. And again, it's not surprising at all, because you see a very powerful military actor, the United States, that can conquer states easily, and that has this political ideology, liberalism, that it believes in. So it's domino theory logic. But back to the Cold War, we were worried stiff that the Soviet Union would conquer this country, conquer that country, and do it very easily. And then this transnational ideology called communism would help facilitate the fall of all the dominoes, including the United States at the end of the story. Okay? So how does this affect US behavior? We fight in Vietnam. Right. Read Fred Logeval's terrific book on Vietnam called Choosing War, which is the best book I've read on why we went into Vietnam. One of the principal reasons we went into Vietnam is almost everybody in a position of power at that point in time, including huge chunks of people in the public, believed in the domino theory. They believed that we had to stop them in Vietnam because if we didn't, dominoes would fall. Right. What's the fate of the domino theory? the domino theory. It's a joke, right? Any good realist understands that the domino theory is a joke. First of all, conquest is really difficult. You know what happened to the Soviets in Afghanistan? You know what's happened to us in Afghanistan? You know what happened to the British in Iraq? You know what's happened to us in Iraq? You know what happened to the French, the Americans, and the Chinese in Vietnam? Nationalism is a real obstacle to conquest. So the idea that you could have easy conquests throughout Southeast Asia, which was what we were thinking about in the 64, 65 period, not going to happen. And then with regard to the ideology, this transnational ideology, communism, communism is no match for nationalism. You run nationalism up against communism, nationalism will win every time. Have you noticed where the Soviet Union has gone? Right? It's broken up. You know, it's series of constituent nation states. Remember the Sino-Soviet split? Oh, by the way, China, communist state, invaded North Vietnam, communist state. Oh, by the way, why did they do that? Because Vietnam, communist state, invaded Cambodia, communist state. Hmm, doesn't sound like that transnational ideology had all that much appeal, right? Nationalism, very powerful force. And of course, when we first went to war in Vietnam, I'm young enough, old enough to remember this, I was young at the time, but the argument was that 
the reason the North Vietnamese were so fearsome, and they were fearsome, right? nobody went into combat against the North Vietnamese had any doubts about that. These were tough hombres. The reason they were so fearsome, so they said, was because they were communists. But with the passage of time, we came to understand that that was fundamentally flawed line of argument. They were so tough because of nationalism, and that's what made conquest so hard. So my point to you, if you had to do the Cold War all over again, this is how I'd do it. I'd be relaxed. I wouldn't worry about the spread of communism, hardly at all. And I certainly would never invade a country like Vietnam. I'd stay out, because the domino theory doesn't work. And I would argue that if we become engaged in an intense security competition with a rising China, which I think is likely to happen if China rises, I think the last thing we want to do is start invading countries for fear of a domino theory-like effect as a result of Chinese aggression. And if anything, if the Chinese get into the business of invading countries that uh, they think they can conquer and facilitate some, of, some kind of uh, uh, domino effect on their part, not going to work. So what I'm saying to you is that both nationalism and realism push the United States toward restraint. Restraint, on the other hand, is anathema to advocates of liberal hegemony. I've tried to make that point clear in the first two lectures. So realism points in one direction, and liberal hegemony or liberal foreign policy points in the other direction. Okay, where is the United States headed? Uh, what does the future hold? I think there are two possible future worlds. Uh, the first future world is multipolarity, and that's a consequence of China's rise and the continued resurrection of Russia. Uh, most people I know think that this is the direction that we're headed in. Most people think we are now entering multipolarity, that we're transitioning out of unipolarity. Uh, it's hard to measure polarity, but even if you don't think that we've reached multipolarity at this point, most people believe it won't be long uh, before we do. Uh, and then the other possibility is unipolarity. And this is the case where China stumbles badly and Russian power declines over time. And this is the argument that we will be more powerful in the year 2050 relative to everybody else than we are now. You all understand, just to give you a feel for this, that America's three principal competitors from the 20th century, Russia slash Soviet Union, Japan, and Germany. Let's think about World War I, World War II. Russia, Germany, Japan. All are declining powers, largely for demographic reasons. All of these countries are going to undergo significant demographic decline. And the United States is in good shape demographically. The only two countries that are really in good shape demographically over time are India and the United States. The Chinese also have quite significant problems, right? But our three principal competitors are going to be much less powerful relative to us in 2050 than they are now. There's only one country on the planet that can give us a run for the money, and that's China. And if the Chinese were to stumble, to stumble really badly, I'm not saying that's likely, I don't think it's likely, but if they were to stumble really badly, we would be more powerful relative to every other state in 2050 than we are today. And we would be free to pursue liberal hegemony again. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so a multipolar future. If China continues to rise, Russia's resurrection from the dead continues, um, it's the end of liberal hegemony. It's just over. 
this is the point that I have made on a number of occasions. You cannot have liberal hegemony in bipolarity or multipolarity. You can only have it in unipolarity. Because if you're in a bipolar system, or you're in a multipolar system where the United States is one of the poles, the United States has to pay attention to the other great power or powers, and it has to engage in balance of power politics. It cannot afford to pursue a liberal foreign policy in any significant way, maybe somewhat on the margins, but the essence of a great power's foreign policy in a bipolar or multipolar world is almost always going to be realism. So if we do move into multipolarity, liberal hegemony is gone. What if we don't? What if we have a unipolar future? Uh, as I say, it's a it's a fertile ground for more liberal hegemony, more liberal hegemony. And therefore the $64,000 question is whether or not it's possible to sell a foreign policy of restraint in a unipolar world to a country like the United States, to the sole pole. Uncle Sam is the sole pole, thoroughly liberal country. We've tried this once before. We're back in unipolarity. Can we sell a policy of restraint? This is the Montero template that I put up yesterday. This is from Nuno's book on unipolarity. And you remember I pointed out that Nuno argues that in a unipolar world, the unipole has three options. The unipole can go home because it's so powerful and secure. Uh, Number two, it could stay involved abroad and use its power to maintain the status quo. Or three, it could stay involved abroad and use its power to alter the status quo, engage in serious social engineering. And of course, as I said yesterday, and you folks all surely understand, the pursuit of liberal hegemony is number three. And restraint could be one or two and I would argue that restraint could be somewhere in between one and two. Number one is basically isolationism. Isolationism is a policy of restraint. And given the three options that Nuno puts on the table, I think number two is also a policy of restraint. So you could just have a foreign policy where the United States pretty much stays where it is, but doesn't try to reshape the globe in its own image. For my purposes, I'd prefer a policy that's somewhere between numbers one and two. I don't want to get into this in any detail, but I'm not an isolationist, so I don't want to, you know, uh, practice come home America. But at the same time, if I had my druthers in a unipolar world, I, I would not stay involved abroad in every region of the world. Uh, I'd pull back in a lot of regions. I'd certainly pull back American forces from Europe. Uh, but anyway, the point that I'm trying to make to you is that a policy of restraint actually in practice involves uh, something uh, along the lines of one or two uh, in Nuno's template or somewhere in between. But that's what we're talking about. Now, are there any reasons for optimism? optimism about the possibility of adopting a more restrained foreign policy and unipolarity. There are some reasons. First of all, the decision to initially adopt a policy of liberal hegemony is different than the decision to continue it at a critical decision point or the decision to go back to it after a brief hiatus. Uh, and my argument is that it's almost impossible to prevent a liberal unipole that hasn't tried liberal hegemony from trying it, right? Because 
the, 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 the DNA of a liberal hegemony is such that it's very hard to resist the temptation to reorder the world in ways that you think are of great advantage to you and all of humanity. Uh, so I think the initial decision to adopt unipolarity is almost impossible to combat. Uh, to adopt liberal hegemony is almost impossible to combat. But a subsequent decision to do it, once you've run the experiment, you've seen what the costs are and what the benefits are and the likelihood of success are, I think you stand a pretty good chance of, uh, of combating it. Uh, there are other factors too. Uh, there's actually little public support for liberal hegemony. It's basically an elite driven enterprise. Uh, you want to remember that uh, George W. Bush got elected in 2000 running against nation building and arguing that what we have to do is pull in our horns and not try to reshape the globe. George W. Bush as a presidential candidate was very critical of, uh, uh, of the Clinton administration for being far too ambitious uh, on the foreign stage. And he was elected and then he became the most, I think, the most ambitious foreign policy president in our history. He was a liberal hegemonist par excellence. Read his second inauguration address. Read a number of the speeches that he gave at places like AEI. George W. Bush sounds just like Woodrow Wilson. There's no better spokesperson for liberal hegemony than George W. Bush. That may be hard to believe, but I'm not exaggerating. It's really quite remarkable. But anyway, he ran as a candidate calling for restraint. Go back and read Condoleezza Rice's famous piece in, far, in the January-February 2000 issue of Foreign Affairs, where she, who was very close to George W. Bush, laid out his foreign policy. It's all there. And then you remember Barack Obama. Barack Obama got elected on the platform that he was going to pursue restraint. And uh, uh, he, of course, failed. And he basically admitted he failed in his interview with Jeffrey Goldberg in the Atlantic in his last year in office. But he was interested as a candidate in restraint, and he got elected, and George W. Bush got elected. And as you heard me say yesterday, Donald Trump, Donald Trump ran against liberal hegemony really hard. He challenged almost every element of the strategy, and he got elected. So the public has no problem electing leaders who are opposed to liberal hegemony and are in favor of restraint. But the problem is once those leaders are in office, they seem to go in the other direction. Uh, but anyway, the public could be mobilized. The US also has a rich history of restraint. Stephen Kinzer has this new book out, terrific book, you should read it if you have an opportunity, uh, that deals with the first great foreign policy debate in the United States regarding whether or not we should go abroad uh, and intervene in the politics of other states in a big way or we should basically pursue a policy of restraint. And it's a debate that takes place after the Spanish-American War in 1898. It's a huge debate and Kinzer lays it out in great detail. And of course the restrainers lose. Uh, but Kinzer makes the point that if you look at the history of debates about American foreign policy over the course of the 20th century, you see that the restrainers are there in force at almost every key decision point. And actually, in the 1930s, when the United States was an isolationist country, the restrainers were in the driver's seat. I don't think that was a good thing, by the way. I think isolation was not, isolationism was not in America's national interest. And I think it's fortunate that we got into the war. But the only point I'm trying to make to you here is that restrainers, in the form of isolationists, were very powerful at that point in time. And after World War II, there was a huge debate between restrainers, isolationists again, and uh, people who wanted to use American military force uh, broadly. Uh, moreover, I do think that states learn and they have agency. Uh, We've seen what happens. This gets back to my earlier point. This is not 
you know, liberal hegemony is not something that we haven't tried before. We've tried it now. We've run the test. We've run the experiment. And uh, there's no reason that we can't uh, change things. And then I would argue there's an emerging counter elite of restrainers in this country. There are growing numbers of people who are disenchanted uh, with what the United States has been doing and who think it would be uh, smart for us to pull in our horns to pursue a more restrained foreign policy. So I think for all these reasons, there's a good chance that restraint could uh, carry the day. Nevertheless, the majority in the foreign policy establishment, the blob, right, is deeply attached, deeply attached to uh, liberal hegemony. And they'll do everything they can uh, to stymie restraint. Uh, my good friend Steve Walt has recently uh, finished a book manuscript that deals with the blob and its love of liberal hegemony. And he makes a somewhat different argument than I do, but it reinforces the point that the blob has a deep-seated interest in uh, uh, combating restraint and continuing to pursue liberal hegemony. But Steve's basic argument is not like mine. Mine is that liberalism as an ideology, right, provides a very powerful impetus for pursuing liberal hegemonies. Steve's argument is that it's basically a jobs program for the liberal elite, right, that uh, all these people in Washington have jobs that depend on uh, 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 having uh, the United States run the world so that, you know, they can occupy very important peace uh, positions in the State Department and the Defense Department and National Security Council. And if you begin to shrink all those institutions, right, and you don't have military bases all over the world, and you're not interfering in the politics of every country on the planet, right, people are going to start losing jobs. And, you know, lots of people graduating from Yale who want to become part of the foreign policy establishment. You know that, right? Uh, you want to go out and help run the world. And if the United States pulls in its horns, what are you going to do? You may have to go to graduate school and get a PhD in political science. Oh my God. Or in history, right? <laughs> you know, you'd rather go to law school or something or go to the Kennedy School, get a degree, and then go out and run the world, right? It's a jobs program. It, it doesn't contradict my argument. You understand, John has made a very different argument here over three days. John's argument focuses on liberal ideology and says that that ideology is deeply wired into the American body populace, especially the elites, right? And, and therefore, we pursue this policy, liberal hegemony, because we are in a unipolar world. That's the argument. Steve has a different argument, but it reinforces my argument. And his argument, again, is it's basically a jobs program for the elite. Uh, so they'll fight mightily. Uh, to uh, prevent us from pursuing a policy of restraint. My bottom line, final slide. I think China is likely to continue rising, uh, and I think uh, liberal hegemony will be off the table. And the really interesting questions down the road will have to do with the U.S.-China rivalry. So when Ian invites me back to talk the next time, there will be little discussion of liberal hegemony and much discussion of basic realpolitik behavior in East Asia. That's what I think is likely to happen. So we won't have to worry much about liberal hegemony. But the problem with that is that the United States then ends up with a peer competitor, China. Do we want that? I think I'd rather have unipolarity and run the risk of returning to liberal hegemony rather than see China turn into a peer competitor. But again, if China becomes a peer competitor, liberal hegemony goes away. In the event the world resorts back to unipolarity, which I'd prefer to see over continuing rise of China for good realist reasons, uh, it's hard to say whether restraint will carry the day. Uh, I don't know. I think uh, there are some good reasons for optimism, but there are also some good reasons for pessimism. So on that note, uh, 
I will end and I will gladly take questions from the audience. You mentioned that uh, Europe and uh, the Persian Gulf would remain of interest to uh, optimistic um, version of your realism. I don't understand the Persian Gulf argument because if the U.S. goes renewable energy, that goes away. We see this already in the import-export balances. And second, I don't see the European argument, although I come from Europe and I'm well aware of the history. Frankly, only this country is made up of Russia, meaning Alaska, Mexico slash Spain, and of course, overseas possessions of the, the former UK and uh, France. But otherwise, the US is disassociating long term from Europe, and U Europe is willing to let this go over the next few decades once it learns to how to defend itself. So let, why can you make let me, let me ask you a, Let me ask you a question. When you say when Europe learns how to defend itself, what, yeah. is, what does that mean? What, what, Europe, Europe is not a country. It's a series of countries, isn't it? Or aren't those, a, isn't it? Isn't Europe comprised of a series of sovereign nation states? How does Europe defend itself? I'm o I don't mean to be provocative, but I'm always puzzled when people use that rhetoric. Well, first of all, you use the term Europe, so I took your term. And <laughs> Europe is something, at least the European <laughs> Union is something between something semi cohesive, and if in doubt, during crisis, it falls back to its essentially. Uh, confederation, what it is by default. But the core countries in Europe more or less have realized the U.S. is not ultimately willing to defend it in the very long run, or at least they run the risk of the, in the end will have to arm themselves. But of course they have difficulties with self okay. domestic audiences. Okay. <coughs> Let me take your question first on the Persian Gulf and, and then go to Europe. On the Persian Gulf, if we reach a point where oil doesn't matter, Right, where for some reason or another there are other ways of fueling these economies, then the Persian Gulf is not going to matter. Okay? Because the United States cares about Europe and East Asia, because that's where the great powers are. But obviously there are no great powers in the Gulf. There's oil in the Gulf. But in your scenario, oil doesn't matter much anymore, then it's not going to be of great strategic importance. So I think we're in agreement on that. With regard to Europe, where I think there's a bit more disagreement between the two of us, look, I think there are two good reasons for staying in Europe. My defensive realist friends who I, were talking about, who I was talking about before, they want to stay in Europe because they believe it's important to preserve the peace in Europe. And their argument is that if you take the United States away and NATO collapses, right, You'll have the Russians and the Germans competing with each other. The Germans and the French will not trust each other. The British will be separate from the states on the continent. And if you have a war in Europe, right, that will mean the United States will have to come back in. And this will have economic consequences for us. So it's better just to stay there and in Joseph Joffe's terms, remain as the American pacifier. We are the underpinning the underpinning of stability we the Americans are the underpinning of stability in Europe and, and let's just keep it that way okay so that's one way of thinking about Europe but it assumes of course that you'll have war among European states that the EU is not enough uh, to prevent that by itself that's not my view my view is that the United States should only go into Europe with military force if there is one state that threatens to dominate all of Europe, be that Imperial Germany in 1914, Nazi Germany in 1939, and the Soviet Union in 1945, right? The United States has to come in to make sure that none of those, not three countries, dominates all of Europe. And when I look at Europe today, there's no state that threatens to dominate all of Europe. Germany, as I said, is depopulating. It's getting weaker and weaker. I believe Germany has about 19 million more people than France and Britain today. If you look at, I think it's UN demographic projections out to the year. Pardon? 30 million more than France and roughly 20 more. It's 83.5 million Germans. 
Las Vegas census. Okay, well, I'll give you that. But I, I, I do think you're wrong, but I'll give it to you. Uh, let's, go out to the year, let's go out to the year 2050. The demographic projections put France, Britain, and Germany all the same size demographically. It's because the Germans are uh, declining so rapidly, right? So Germany's not a problem. Russia's not a problem. Russia's a declining great power in large part for demographic reasons. So why are we in Europe from my point of view? Again, my friends who want to just preserve the peace there, we are a peacekeeper, they'll stay. But I'm not interested in preserving the peace. I'm just worried about a dominant power in the region. The area I would stay in is China, excuse me, is East Asia because of the Chinese, right? That, that's the argument. But, so I'm not that interested in staying in Europe, but other people are. Yes, 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 sir. Um, you haven't mentioned economic interests in terms of the, the um, conflict or whatever, the debate between liberal hegemony and uh, realist policy. Do you think that there are certain economic interests or, or branches of the economy or whatever you want to put it uh, that tend to push one or favor one type of policy, or is it purely in the realm of ideology? Yeah, I would just change the word purely in the realm of ideology to purely in the realm of politics, okay. but which I think is completely consistent with what you said. It's a great question, uh, and I haven't thought much about it, but I think that what I'm saying is that it really is all about politics. Because you're, you're raising the question about the differences between liberal hegemony and realism, right? And, and you're saying, is there an economic factor that discriminates A from B? And I think the answer is no. What makes me nervous about this is because I'm a political scientist and I focus on geopolitics, I almost instinctively go for the politics and I tend to forget the economics. So I'm saying to myself as you're asking the question, maybe I'm just forgetting the economic dimension. But I don't think so. I think there's no real economic dimension that explains the differences between the two. I think liberalism is really all about uh, it's all about spreading liberal democracy. And realism is all about the balance of power. Now, some people might say that liberalism emphasizes the importance of creating an open economic order, an open international economic order. I think that's certainly true, but so do realists, right? Everybody agrees that the open international order that we created roughly from 1945 up until the end of the Cold War and then worked to maintain up until Donald Trump was elected was a good thing, you know, realists and liberals. Realists and liberals didn't fight over economic issues and they didn't fight over institutions either. Liberals tend to love institutions, but realists really kind of love institutions too, right? So economics, institutions, there's no real divergence. I think it's the politics. Uh, but uh, as we're going along here, if something pops into my mind, I'll tell you. <laughs> Sir. Um, can, you, can you say a word about China's strategy? Seems like they've been doing uh, economic hegemony. They've been doing it in Africa. They've been doing it with us in terms of the currency manipulation. Do you see that as a prelude to a political aspiration? Or are they really? changing the rules of how states will interact with each other? I don't believe the Chinese are changing the rules. Uh, I believe that the Chinese are interested in dominating Asia the way we dominate the Western Hemisphere. Uh, I believe that they will ultimately try to push us out of East Asia. They will tell you behind closed doors, many of their elites, that they intend to push us out beyond the first island chain and then beyond the second island chain. They intend to build a blue water navy that can project power into the Persian Gulf because they get 25% of their oil from the Gulf and that number is expected to go up to close to 30% in the next 15 years. So they, they are very ambitious, right? And so this is... What are they doing in Africa? With building well, before I get to Africa, because I, I want to... Just, I'll, I'll come to Africa, but you raise a really very important point about what the Chinese are up to, right? And, and not so much in Africa, just in terms of what they're doing. 
uh, more generally with regard to using military force. The key point you want to keep in mind about the Chinese is that time is on their side and therefore they have no interest in causing trouble now. The name of the game for them is just to grow and grow and grow. And then when they become Godzilla, tell all the neighbors and tell Uncle Sam, right, here are the new rules in the neighborhood. You have no choice but to obey us, right? We, on the other hand, and China's neighbors, on the other hand, have a vested interest in provoking conflicts and setting the rules of the road now when the balance of power is in our favor. You understand the balance of power is shifting against us in East Asia. So all the incentives are for us to make it clear where we think the lines in the South China Sea are now. The Chinese, on the other hand, should just say nothing. They should speak like good liberal Americans. Peace, love, and dope, right? And then just keep that economy growing and keep translating that economic might into military might. It's like Taiwan. You know the Chinese want Taiwan back. And they made it clear to the Taiwanese that at some point they're going to take it back if the Taiwanese don't surrender. But now is not the time for China to pick a fight over Taiwan. They do much better today in the year 2017 than they would have done in the year 1997. You ramp it back 20 years, it would not have been a fair fight over Taiwan. Chinese would have fared very badly. They'd fare quite well today. But I say wait another 20 years. Wait another 30 years. And the Chinese are very patient. They'll tell you that. 30 years from now, you just basically to tell the Taiwanese. They have no choice. It's all over, ladies and gentlemen. You understand that this is what happened with the British in North America? You understand that after we got our independence in 1783, the British went to great lengths to try to prevent us from dominating the Western Hemisphere? They did not want a hegemon in the Western Hemisphere. They couldn't prevent it. They thought about intervening in the American Civil War. Because what you do if you intervene in the Civil War, on the side of the South, of course, is you get a confederacy, and the United States, right? You have two countries. That's what they wanted. They wanted a balance of power. But what happened with the British is they reached the point where they understood there was nothing they could do to prevent the United States from dominating the Western Hemisphere. And by the way, they were lucky it turned out that way because we pulled their chestnuts out of the fire in World War I and again in World War II. But they couldn't foresee that. Anyway. I would say to you, I think in the case of China, given the size of that population, they have a per capita GNP that looks anything like Taiwan or South Korea. They are going to be so powerful relative to us. If we're taking them on 6,000 miles from the Chinese, I mean, from the California coast, whoo. So the Chinese are trying to sit still, not do too much to provoke their neighbors or provoke the United States, and just grow and grow and grow. Now, your question about Africa. Africa is an area of little strategic significance, right? It's of little strategic significance. So even though the Chinese are doing all sorts of investment in Africa, and they're deeply involved in Africa, we don't care that much. If, on the other hand, the Chinese start to do that in South America, you know the Monroe Doctrine, right? They start to do that in South America, that would be a very different story. Right. So I think we'll not have major problems with what they're doing in Africa. The Gulf, remember I told you they're building a blue water navy going into the Gulf? This, while well, I'm on stream of consciousness mode here, Iran, Turkey, the Chinese are playing kissy face with the Iranians and the Turks. The United States is foolishly driving the Iranians into the arms of the Chinese. Right. Don't want to do that. You're going to want to minimize Chinese influence in the Persian Gulf. And given our relations with the Iranians and given our growing relations with the Chinese, don't want to push them together. Same thing is true with the Turks. But that's, you know, Persian Gulf, important area, unless this gentleman's view on the Gulf is correct. Uh, and uh, Africa just doesn't matter that much.
So you mentioned um, Russia, Japan, and Germany as declining powers, and China being in the future probably the only country that can legitimately challenge the United States as a peer competitor. And so my question was, why is your prediction that we're headed towards multipolarity instead of bipolarity, and what are the implications of that? Well, I think that Russia will be a weak great power, right? That, that would be my argument. I wish I could give you simple indicators that measure power. And I wish I could say, I've done the calculations and the Chinese will have 50 units of power, we'll have 49 units of power, and they'll have 21, but they're above the threshold of 20. But it's very hard, it's not very hard, it's impossible to do that. But my, my basic argument is that you will end up with multipolarity with two big enchiladas and one small player, but still a great power. Uh, and, uh, and that will be the Russians. It may be the case that we do end up in a bipolar world, which is, I think, what you were hinting at. Yes, ma'am. No, yes. I just have a brief question. Could you talk a little bit louder, please? Um, I just have a brief question about, okay. um, because there is a hot topic in China about the global leadership. And um, scholars in China tends to, tends to talk about the this topic, uh, whether China uh, will take over, will become a global leadership, will take over the U.S. leadership. And last uh, last time, uh, when Chuck Hager uh, here uh, gave a lecture, he said that uh, he's, um, he thinks that um, China has no uh, capabilities nor uh, willingness to lead the, um, the world. And in our class, and uh, Nuno said that, um, Professor uh, Montero said that um, even China is now um, uh, 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 has um, an economic advantage, but uh, in, uh, in current um, uh, US uh, leadership, uh, US does, does not uh, threaten China uh, to develop their economy, so China has no uh, intention to develop their military. And in this case, China is not going to be a, a military uh, hegemony, so that will not threaten the uh, U.S. Who says that? Uh, from Montero. I'll have to talk to him. Power, so he doesn't think that uh, China will become a great power as the U.S. is. Okay. So, about the global street, uh, uh, about the global leadership, was yeah, let me make a, a number of points uh, to your excellent questions. Uh, when I go to China, uh, I often pose this question to my interlocutors. I say, look, you folks got hooked on capitalism and you joined the American-led order in the early 1980s. And if you look at what's happened since then, you've just got richer and richer and richer you're really in a wonderful position and you have benefited enormously from participating in this American-led order. Moreover, the Americans pay the costs of maintaining the order, right? You don't have to pay the costs. And in no way, shape, or form does the U.S. military threaten you. So why don't you just sort of sit back and relax and accept the fact that we run the world and just get rich. I have never met a single Chinese who likes that argument, <laughs> right? They don't like that argument. Now, two points. One, just let's talk about economic, excuse me, let's talk about institutions. When you talk about the liberal order or you talk about international order, order is all about institutions. The Chinese, not surprisingly, are interested in number one, creating new institutions that they run. The AIIB fits in this category. And they're also interested in increasing their influence in existing institutions. The Chinese ambassador to the United States, who I know very well from way back when, he has written in foreign affairs that look, when these institutions were created, mainly by the United States, China had no say in the rules. And therefore, the rules privilege the United States. You all understand when the United States creates institutions, they're set up to privilege us. Others benefit too, but mainly us. Well, the Chinese are getting really powerful, so they say we should be able 
to rewrite the rules. Okay? And with regard to the South China Sea, you've been watching what the Chinese do in the South China Sea? That doesn't look like a status quo power to me. You looking, you watching what they're doing in the East China Sea with regard to the Diao or Senkaku Islands? That doesn't look like a status quo power to me. They're building a blue water navy. They're spending one heck of a lot of money on defense, right? This is not a status quo power. This is a power that wants to throw its weight around. And I don't blame them one bit. You remember what happened to the Chinese when they were weak, right? The century of national humiliation. 1850 to 1950, roughly, you don't want to be weak. The Chinese understand this full well. They want to be really powerful. They want to be Godzilla. They want to be up here, and they want the Japanese down here, and they want the Americans on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. And I don't blame them one bit. I like the Monroe Doctrine, so why shouldn't they? Right? <coughs> this is my view of the Chinese. Right. Now, just with regard to leadership, you know, are they going to be the <coughs> global leader? You know, given Donald Trump's performance up to now, it kind of looks like, that may happen uh, if China continues to grow and he's in power for eight years. But I would just say to you, the United States is not going to surrender easily to the Chinese, right? The United States is a jealous God, and the United States will go to great lengths to remain the top dog in East Asia and prevent China from dominating East Asia. And the end result is that to the extent that you have an order in the international system, an order, an international order. It's not going to be an American dominated order if China continues to grow. The two of them, the Chinese and the Americans, will compete to run that order. And that's the world I see sort of in front of us, not one where the United States dominates and not one where China dominates. And of course, this all assumes that China continues to grow economically. Sir. Yeah, so my question, I guess, follows on the last one. Um, and it's, have we already passed the point where China's rise to great power status, barring some you know, demographic crisis or major fumble uh, by the Chinese, can be stopped? And can, if, if not, when you say can be stopped, you mean can be stopped by the United yes. States? Yes, so the second part of the question is, if not, what could the United States do to bring that about? And either way, whether or not it can be stopped, how concerned are you that the policies you seem to advocate for here create a high likelihood for small wars for maybe a low likelihood of a great power war? I don't understand the last part of the question. So if we shift our focus from sort of dilly-dallying around in places that don't matter, right, you know, conducting operations in 50 of 54 African countries, and yeah, yeah, instead yeah. say, like, we're going to try and stop the rise of China. Contain China. Right. What does is, what is Chinese containment do one, does, do you think there's a chance it could work? And two, what do you think it does about the chance of Oh, I see what you're Yeah, good, good. Okay. Uh, I, I think, look, uh, that if China continues to rise, as I was indicating in response to the young woman's question, I, I think there's no question that the United States will try to contain China. And then you raise the specter of, now we're talking about a great power <coughs> war, John. We're not talking about small wars in the periphery. I think you're exactly right. Uh, I think that containment uh, against China will be dangerous. Uh, I can just unpack that a bit for you. Um, if you think about the Cold War, uh, the, the central front in Europe was the principal place that we thought a war would break out between the United States and the Soviet Union. But the truth is, when we used to run war games during the Cold War, we could never get a war started in Europe. And the reason is, you had two massive armies armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons. And nobody knew for sure what would happen when they crashed into each other. But it was very easy to paint plausible scenarios where we all got vaporized. And that's not a good thing. So you had no war, right? It, 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 you know, this gets to this great paradox that underpins deterrence, which is the more horrible a war is likely to be, the less likely you'll have that war to begin with. But of course, if the war happens, oh my God. Okay, but fast forward to East Asia today, the United States and China. The potential points of conflict are the South China Sea, the East China Sea, Taiwan, 
you can imagine plausible scenarios where we end up shooting at each other. We end up in a war. I'm not arguing for one second it's likely, right? But I'm just building on your point, which I think is correct, that, you know, liberal hegemony, for all its faults, involves small wars where not that many Americans die. And if you get into a serious containment effort against China, the potential for real trouble is great. Sure. Um, I think I understand the liberal institutionist uh, policy perspectives <coughs> for avoiding war in the South China Sea. Graham Allison's work was a pretty good example, I think. Um, what is the structural realist or the offensive realist policy prescription for avoiding it, if, that, if it's so likely? The direct foreign investment in South America already exceeds, from the last time I checked, what it does in Africa from China. They're slicing the salami in the South China Sea. They might take a rock and some cockings, like you were saying. What is the what is the policy prescription to not have total war? Well, I don't think, well, I don't think you're going to have total war. As I say to this gentleman here, I think you're more likely to have a limited war out in the water. Uh, yeah. it, it is possible that it could escalate to a total war, I th although I think that's quite unlikely. Uh, look, I don't have a good answer. Uh, to how you avoid war, uh, other than to say you want to make sure you uh, have sufficient forces to make the other side think that they can't start a war uh, and, uh, and succeed uh, at achieving their objectives. Uh, you want to go to great lengths yourself to make sure that you don't engage in rollback rollback. You don't want to do rollback. You want to do containment. You know, there's this whole literature on the Cold War now that shows what we did a lot more than containment. We were heavily into rollback, which is very offensive in nature. I don't think you want to engage in rollback. This is a form of restraint in a competition with the, uh, with the, with the Chinese. Uh, so, you, you know, you want to do things like that, but uh, can you be sure <coughs> Uh, that you won't have a war? The answer is no. And again, as I said to this gentleman here, I think you know, you can paint uh, a plausible picture of how you get a war. We have time for two more questions. So. Uh, I have. Can you explain to me uh, what to make of the new term that the administration now uses, Indo-Pacific, instead of East, in the Asia-Pacific? Indo-Pacific. Indo-Pacific. Gee, I hadn't heard the term, I, and, and it's kind of hard to figure out what it might mean. When I hear the word Indo, I think of Indonesia, but Indonesia is not, you know, likely to I, Indo. I, I, have, I have tried to make sense of it. Yeah. I found nowhere. Sounds like a task for Wikipedia. <laughs> it's increasing. Sorry. It may be next to Nambia. <laughs> <laughs> Did somebody have a question? Um, I had a question on the uh, nature of uh, future coexistence between the two emerging world powers of the United States and China. But in the case of the Cold War, you actually have parallel structures, that is, the Soviet Union and their allies, etc., who didn't really interact, ex the, 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 the two economies yeah. yeah. were yeah. not intertwined at all. Yeah. They are two totally separate systems. For sure. The difference in this is that you now have at least the economic activity in the world very highly intertwined. And so you have more places for interaction and therefore competition and leadership of institutions. So that, say, in the economic institutions, the IMF, World Bank, WTO, etc., they were out. So the issue of competition didn't arise. Okay. Now they're all there together. Good. Okay, I'll answer your question. Uh, with regard to, you remind me, after I'm done with him, I want to go back and uh, just deal with one issue. It was very important that you raised, but it slipped out of my brain. Just say Britain, Germany, when I point to you, okay, because I'll forget, it's early Alzheimer's. With regard to his question, uh, 
great question. Let me just embellish it a bit. He, he's comparing the U.S.-Soviet competition with a U.S.-China competition. And he's making the argument uh, that what's really different is you have economic interdependence, right, today. And you had virtually no economic interdependence during the Cold War. And he's absolutely right. And as many of you know, one of the principal liberal theories of peace is economic interdependence theory. I've given my talk on why China cannot rise peacefully probably 150 times and probably 50 times in China. And I get three, three counter arguments. You know, people come at me as always happens in these things. People come at me. And the argument that is used against me 90% of the time is the economic interdependence argument. The reason that John is wrong and a U.S.-China situation is different than a U.S.-Soviet situation is because there was no economic interdependence then and there is now. So that, that, that is the argument. Uh, I'm not going to knock the argument down, or let me put it differently, I'm not going to try to knock the argument down, but I don't agree with that argument as you would expect. But that is an argument that I think is the principal competitor. But let me make just another point, because this is a very important subject. This is another argument that you occasionally hear, and that is that the Cold War had a really vicious ideological dimension to it. It was communism versus liberal democracy slash capitalism. And basically what you're going to get, because communism is not a meaningful ideology in China, is you're just going to get good old-fashioned great power politics, right? And uh, so we don't have to worry very much uh, about ideology fueling the conflict between China and the United States as we had to during the Cold War. My counter to that, which I'll just point out because it ties into nationalism, is that because the Communist Party does not have a lot of legitimacy in Beijing or in China more generally, they've begun to play the nationalism card in a big way. And their <coughs> nationalism card centers on, as I was saying to this young woman here, the century of national humiliation. The Chinese really drive home the century of national humiliation. And who are the two principal humiliators in the story? Japan and the United States. And nationalism is a very powerful force. So you get into a crisis. You could have that ideological dimension really matter, even though communism as in the Cold War is not there. I just want to say, it, he asked an excellent question, but it slipped out of my mind. You asked whether there was... Carpet. Pardon? The carpet. No, you asked the question about whether there was anything we could do to stop China's rise. And the answer is, there's nothing we can do to stop China's rise. And I had a guy who wrote a dissertation on this uh, for me. He actually teaches at Yale Singapore. But let me just say a few words on this. What he did was he looked at how Britain dealt with Germany's rise. You understand that Germany doesn't exist until 1870. There's no Germany until 1870. It's Prussia and a handful of other German places like Bavaria. And uh, Bismarck, uh, with three wars, 1864, 1866, 1870, puts Germany together. And then the Germans are making huge numbers of babies, and they're making lots of steel. So the British, from 1870 forward, see Germany rising. And the question is, what do you do about it, right? I believe the crossover point is 1905. Do you try and strangle the, cra the baby in the cradle, right? And the British, not surprisingly, have a huge debate on this issue. What can we do to stop Germany's rise? And given what happened in World War I and World War II, it might have been a good idea if they'd been able to stop it. But what the British come to conclude is given the economic interdependence of the day, the British come to conclude that in trying to wreck the German economy, they would do more damage to their own economy than they would to the German economy. And my student argues that, yes, we could do a great deal to wreck the Chinese economy and prevent their rise, but we would do more damage to ourselves than we would to uh, the Chinese. So there's no way to slow down Chinese economic growth from our side. I mean, it may happen 
for internal reasons in China, but there's nothing we can do. And therefore, the best we can do is to contain China, and then we get down to this whole question that you and the gentleman in the rear raised about whether or not you can do that peacefully. And that is a tricky issue. So before we draw things to a close and thank Professor Mearsheimer, I just want to say there will be a reception upstairs on the second floor immediately following this lecture to which everybody is invited to continue the conversation. Um, I've been to many <laughs> lecture series at Yale. Usually by the time we get to the third lecture, <laughs> there's a real question, will there be an audience? Uh, will, will, will the people run out of questions? Will it sort of fade away? Uh, none of those things have happened here. I think we could have a fourth and a fifth. Uh, if, if, uh, Don't we have another half hour? <laughs> But this has really been terrific. We're all looking forward to the book, and thank you so much for doing yeah. it. Yeah, thank you. Very much. I appreciate it.